Good afternoon all. Welcome to the Appellate Division First Department. I will call the calendar at this time. At the, at, as I call the calendar, I will also state the time which has been allotted uh, per side for argument. People versus Kevin Colon, five and one and five. Christine versus Pedro, submitted. Billig versus Schwartz, six and two, six and six. Nurse v. New York City Department of Education, five and two and five. People v. Zoltan Garagas, four and one and five. United Natural versus Goldman Sachs, seven and seven. AB versus NYU, five and two and five. People versus Christopher Santana, four and one and three. Trifolet versus Cipolla and company. Uh, that is a, there are two uh, appeals. It's Trifolet versus Cipolla and company on one and Trifolet versus Trifolet. On the first appeal, it's seven and seven. On the second appeal, it's five and five. However, you can uh, split it the way you wish to split it. Mobley versus New York City Transit Authority, four and three. That's Manas versus Valero, submitted. Ellington Owners versus 200 Broadhurst, five and five. People versus Tremaine Francis, five and five. CW Capital Colbert, Cobalt, excuse me, versus CW Capital Investments, six and two and six. Barrett Japanin versus Biologria, six and six. Uh, that is, again, that's uh, two appeals on this one. The second one is Barrett Japanin versus New York City Loft Board, six, six and six. People, versus, uh, People of New York versus Northern Leasing, submitted. Baraba versus Baraba, submitted. Board of Managers versus uh, Healy, submitted. As Ms. Rojas uh, mentioned, we have a full house. And as you can see, uh, almost every case is being argued. Why, I do not know. So I am going to be extremely strict with the time. And you will be given the time that has been allotted. If you need less time, that is perfectly OK with us. Also, please keep in mind, we have read the briefs. We, we are familiar with their arguments. We are familiar with the facts of the case as well. So I would suggest that you stay to uh, those points which you think are most germane uh, to your arguments. Also, it is the tradition of this court and it is the, the policy of this court and the procedures of this court that you not talk over the uh, judges uh, during the arguments. Obviously, when you're virtual as we are, this becomes all the more important. Lastly, please uh, remain muted, uh, muted, and muted until such time as uh, it is your turn to argue. Okay. So the first case up for argument is People versus Kevin Cologne. Good, good afternoon, Your Honors. Antonio Villamil for Mr. Cologne. Um, may it please the court. Uh, this is an exceedingly simple case. The sentencing court in this in this case did not make a determination about youthful offender status as it was uh, required to do by law, and therefore this court should reverse and remand for that determination to so be at made. The time, at the time of plea, this the uh, court specifically stated that she was not going to confer youth for offender status. I believe the defense attorney requested the same, and she said, "I'm not going to." Uh, I'm not going to uh, give YO. Yes, Judge. And at the time of sentencing, I'm sorry, she referred back to statements made at the time of the plea. So why is that not uh, sufficient? So, Judge, what CPL uh, 72020 requires is a determination at the time of sentencing. And a determination is a determination. A determination is not a referral back to a prior decision. Uh, it's clear under the plain language of CPL 72020 that there's a chronology baked in to the statute. There's a conviction of an eligible uh, defendant. Then the court must order a pre-sentence report. And then with the benefit of the pre-sentence report has to make at sentencing a determination about youthful offender status. And, and the timing, Your Honors, is, is exceedingly critical here because the pre-sentence report you know, in, in People v. Rudolph, the, the landmark uh, youthful offender uh, decision, the Court of Appeals went at l great lengths to explain what a critical decision youthful offender, granting it or not granting it, is in any individual case. Uh, and and it's, it's important not only for the offender, but for society at large. So the court wanted to make sure that 
uh, courts in making this determination had information that was relevant and that was important to making that decision. And that's why the, the court is required to have the benefit of the pre-sentence report when it makes a decision about youthful offender. Uh, the, for example, in this case, the court would have known that Mr. Cologne was 16 years old and a month old uh, at the time of his offense. It would have known that he had no criminal record uh, at the time that he committed this offense. But what it would well, have known- Obviously, obviously uh, he had no criminal record. Otherwise, I mean, not obviously. But uh, why is it that you believe that the court did not read and take into consideration the uh, pre-sentence report? There's nothing in the record which would suggest that the court did not do so. Well, what the court didn't do and what's clear from the record is that the court, when it made its determination about YO, the pre-sentence report hadn't even been uh, created yet. It wasn't even in existence. If we look at what the court said specifically at the sentencing, uh, the court said, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm quoting here, um, and just to reiterate, on the date that we took the plea, so the court is referring to a prior proceeding, not this proceeding, not the sentencing, at the date that we take the plea, defense counsel did request youthful offender status for his client, and upon the court's review, that was denied. In other words, it's not being denied now, it was denied then. And at that time, the court didn't have the pre-sentence report. The court, it wasn't the sentencing as required under CPL 72020. Uh, so so the, the determination was made at an inopportune time, at an irrelevant time. It was supposed to have been made at that proceeding, at the sentencing proceeding. And the reasons for that, uh, you know, I've stated, you know, the court needs to have the pre-sentence report. That's why CPL 72020 should be interpreted very strictly. I, I point your honors to uh, people v. Munoz. Pastor, didn't the court at the sentencing say that he reviewed the pre-sentence report? Yes, but not. But but my point is not that the court didn't review the pre-sentence report. The court. And, yeah. The court did review the pre-sentence report. <laughs> But it reviewed the pre-sentence report after it made the decision about youthful offender. Well, so at the time, court, I'm sorry, go ahead, Judge Mazzarelli. Didn't the court go on to say, and just to reiterate, on the date that we took the plea, defense counsel did request youthful offender status for his clients, and upon the court's review, that was denied. Yes, the court did state that. But what I'm saying is that the court, when by, if you read that language, what the court is saying the, court, the language you just read, the court is saying, I made a determination at the plea proceeding about this, so yes, I don't have to look at it now. Between those two sentences is the, this phrase. After the court said that it reviewed the pre-sentence report, the court sees no reason why it should not impose the promised sentence, which was five years prison and five years post-release supervision with a final order of protection. Right. So the court is, is indicating that it's reviewed the sentence report, it's reviewed its decision, and it's adhering to the decision that it made um, on an earlier basis, uh, earlier date, rather. So I'm I'm a little puzzled as to what else. I mean, what you know, we we, we take a plea. There's no particular uh, words that you have to say. There, there's no catechism that's given to the court. It must be said each time there's a plea taken, each time there's a waiver. And, and this is very similar. The court indicated it read the report, it evaluated the report, and it was adhering at that time. When you say you're adhering, you're making the decision anew. I, I guess I, I, I interpret the record differently, Your Honor. And, and, oh. and I'm, I refer, Your Honor, to the just the plain language of, of what the court is saying. It's, it's saying that it made a decision about YO at the time of the plea proceeding. Uh, I think it says that clearly for the reasons I stated, you know, the court says that the decision was made. Uh, it refers to the time of the plea proceeding. I, I think that the court needed to make that decision at the time of sentencing. Thank I you, Counselor. That people, you. is there any people? Thank you. Uh, may it please the court, Daniel Young on behalf of the people. Your Honor, this case is very simple. The lower court did properly determine that at the correct time, that defendant was not going to be granted uh, youthful offender status. The case law is clear that the purpose of the youthful offender status uh, statute is to ensure that the court's hands are not tied and that the court can use its discretion in making a determination as to when and where they believe that give, granting youthful offender status to a defendant would be beneficial both to the defendant and to society as a whole. Part of that requires that they make the determination after reading 
the pre-sentence report so that they can have a full picture of what's going on with the defendant. Here, the court said at the plea that it was going to be denying youthful offender status. And then at the time of the sentencing, after it noted that it had read the pre-sentence report and saw no reason to change the agreed upon sentence, it simply reaffirmed that after reading the pre-sentence report, its initial decision was still the decision that it stood by. So, so you see no issues in terms of the court having adhered to the statute in terms of having read the pre-sentence report and after having read the pre-sentence report, making a determination that it was not going to confer youthful offender status. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. So as the Court of Appeals has said, the, the point of it is so that the court can use its discretion where it sees fit and that the court wants to ensure that the lower level courts have at their disposal all of the information about the defendant in making that determination. Here, it's very clear from the record that the court did review the PSR and upon review, they saw no reason why they should suddenly grant youthful offender status to the defendant. Thank so, you. Any other questions? No? Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Your Mr. Villamil, you have one minute. Yeah, yes, Your Honor. I just want to. I just want to point back, Your Honor, to the plain language of the report. Says it. It says clearly that it's made. It had made its decision at the plea proceeding, not now. I think it's clear that, that indicates that the decision was made prior to the sentencing in contravention of the statute. If If Your Honors find that that's ambiguous, the, the obligation on the court under Rudolph is that it. You know that the court create a record that shows that it made that determination at the sentencing. So if to the extent that this is an ambiguous hearing, I think your honor still need to reverse and remand for a determination of YO at sentence. And the alternative I'm asking for- uh, Any questions? Thank you very much, counselor. Thank you. The next uh, case up for uh, argument is Billick versus Schwartz. Hey, yes, good afternoon, your honors. I'm Randall T. Eng for the appellants, Billick and Schwartz. What we have here, Your Honors, is the uh, dismissal at the pleading stage of a lawsuit that seeks some $11 million in damages. I will uh, direct myself to the uh, decision of the court below, and uh, I will respectfully point out what I believe to be uh, significant errors in the decision of the court. First, I uh, recognize that the court has uh, read the, um, the complaint and are certainly familiar with the record and the briefs. You know that um, it is a complex matter. There are over 300 uh, enumerated paragraphs uh, in the complaint. And uh, it is our position that the complaint uh, includes derivative and uh, individual complaints. And that uh, these of course have to be evaluated separately. Now, the court below recognized that the plaintiffs asserted uh, direct and derivative claims and that they, were in, that they were intermingled. The court also recognized in its decision what it characterized as a myriad procedural errors that were committed here, uh, but uh, did not uh, rule on any of the issues that were raised uh, as to these alleged errors. The court, in um, reviewing the amended complaint that, uh, that was offered, wrote on page two that um, plaintiffs now only seek to bring their claims derivatively and for the benefit of the corporate defendants to redress the breaches of, and it goes on to indicate uh, the specificity of it. It is our position that the court erred when it um, uh, made the representation in its decision that they seek only to bring their claims derivatively. The, uh, the court um, failed to recognize that there were individual claims that were offered here. And the court did recognize, however, that the plaintiffs further alleged that they were members and are members, co-members, et cetera. However, in reaching its if final- If we were to accept uh, that they're standing, yes. uh, does our inquiry end there? Uh, no, it does not, because the, um, the defendants have raised uh, issues that should have been considered by the court below. The court below simply left those issues as pending and uh, undecided. And 
uh, and did not uh, follow its obligation to address those issues. Have, have, the, have, have the plaintiffs separated their derivative claims and their individual claims, or have they pled them in a what we might call intermingled fashion? Some were and some were not, Your Honor. And uh, that, of course, might um, call for the remedy of, um, of repleting uh, or, um, or stating them in some other fashion. Uh, there is, there are claims that are uh, clearly identifiable as being uh, direct and others that are clearly identifiable as being derivative. However, the court below did not extend itself to making those determinations and simply relied upon one substantive issue here. And that substantive issue is standing. Now, uh, to cut to the chase, Your Honors, I, I refer you to um, the complaint uh, there are two key, there are two key uh, paragraphs, and they are 17 and 21. And once again, the court below rested its decision entirely on the standing issue. Now, the um, paragraph 17 reads, plaintiffs Billig and Spear were and are members, co-member and or managers of the corporate entities during the period of the wrongdoing alleged herein and at the time the transgressions complained of. Your Honors, this was not uh, artfully pled, but respectfully, I urge that you consider it as being indeed pled. We're talking about the use of were and are, past tense and present tense. Clearly, there was an attempt here to distinguish. And if by I, saying if our if members- If I may, if yes. I may, this is Judge Gonzalez. So uh, uh, following on um, what Judge Mazzarelli said, if we were to agree with you as to standing, um, how would you distinguish um, granting the plaintiff's motion to amend um, from dismissing the complaint with, with leave to refile a new, a new uh, claim? Yes, I would say that uh, the uh, plaintiff should be afforded that opportunity. Which and, one? Uh, I'm sorry, the, um, to the, the amended complaint. The amended complaint uh, includes uh, causes of action against parties that were uh, referred to in the original complaint, but not named as defendants. And those would be the individuals Spry and Miller. Uh, the, uh, the, the amended complaint, uh, again, uh, contains individual and derivative claims and, and should... Uh, uh, the plaintiffs be afforded the opportunity to file that, it would um, it would cover all of their claims, all of their um, uh, the causes of action, and the amended complaint carried with it a, um, a, a specific affidavit from each of the plaintiffs uh, stating that they are currently members of the LLCs that are concerned here. Thank I, you, Captain. You have two minutes on rebuttal. Um, we have the um, yeah, so Schwartz, who's bargaining for Schwartz. Hi, Your Honors. Um, Diana McCarthy from the law firm Wingett Spada Four in Schwartzburg. Um, so, uh, Your Honors, I don't believe that um, the amended complaint, and I'm just going to cut to the chase here, will even suffice as far as like re reviving this complaint. It's, it's not a very clear complaint. Um, the claims are intermingled. It's difficult to separate the personal from the derivative claims. Um, there's, there's no privity for the legal malpractice claims. The fraud is not alleged properly. I don't think any of the the um, attempts to amend the complaint are going to correct the inartfully and confusing complaint to begin with. And um, I think we, we addressed all of these issues succinctly in our papers, um, and I just don't feel that it's necessary to either remand this case or to allow the plaintiff um, to replead and, and reserve the amended complaint because I think it doesn't correct the errors that are addressed in our brief. Well, counsel, this is Judge Scarpula. Wouldn't it make sense to let the plaintiff replead a, a new complaint, maybe not this the one that they did that they sort of attach without a red line version without well maybe this one is not the right one but uh allow the plaintiff to to try and replead in a way that makes sense 
I don't know if that's possible, Your Honor, based on the facts as I know them that are not alleged in the papers. Um, but I, I don't I don't think it's possible to replead based on the facts that I know. Well, we could we I mean, we could give them a shot to do that. I don't you agree, don't you, that they have put in affidavits that would show their standing. So I think even if we assume that standing wasn't complied properly in the complaint, that the affidavits, the supplementation of those affidavits would allow them to at least, for the purposes of pleading, uh, show standing if they're members of the of the corporation as their I allegations. I'm sorry. I don't I don't believe that those affidavits um, completely satisfy the standing requirement either. Um, I don't think they were in particularized in, in terms of time, place, manner, things of that nature. Um, I think it's more like a blanket affirmation that they were members at the time. At the time. So you don't believe that they would be able to that uh, they would be able to est establish standing at all. No, I do. I, that's correct, Your Honor. I do not. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much, Counselor. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court, Scott Horn, counsel representing the corporate defendants in this matter. What it's is our your position as to standing? Well, our position initially, Your Honor, is they certainly have not established standing based upon the pleading that they submitted and uh, which they filed and served. Uh, if you look at the uh, paragraph 21, indeed, the, the very paragraphs that the appellant is referring to, they clearly pegged their representation to the time of the transgressions, which is clearly uh, a representation that they were members in the past. And there's no specific allegation that they are currently members so as to afford them the standing necessary to maintain a shareholder derivative claim. But even if you move beyond that well, they, issue. They, I, mean, they, I mean, I know the tenses are a little off, but they do say are. They, they do say are, Your Honor, but that's immediately uh, modified and amplified by reference to the times of the past transgressions. So I think that when you look at the language that they've used, it's as the appellant mentioned, it is manifestly inartful, but we submit that it's also fatal under these circumstances. Well, but counsel, if you move beyond- you Judge Scarpula again, are you saying that you don't think there's any set of circumstances that they could establish standing? Did you put in papers that say they don't have standing? They are not now, nor have they ever been members of the uh, corporations? No, Your Honor. So, so, on this... pre -answer, so on a pre answer motion to dismiss, where they put in allegations in the complaint that at the time of the transgressions, they were members of the corporation. And then they supplement with affidavits that say, and we are now members of the, of the corporations. Where, I mean, unless you've got, why not just move and say, put up your own proof that they don't have standing under any circumstance? Because I think it would be very difficult to dismiss a complaint at pre-answer where you have both and some indication in the complaint plus affidavits. And if you think they don't have standing, the remedy for you is to move to dismiss and show that they never were and they aren't now members of the corporation. Well, Your Honor, we are dealing with a 3211A motion. So it's not that's a situation exactly, of bringing exactly. forward, excuse me, Your Honor? That's exactly what I'm saying to you. Right. So we have to assume that those allegations are, too, are true. And the two sets of allegations together make out standing, don't they? Oh. Well, well, I respectfully disagree, Your Honor, but moving beyond that point, dismissal is still necessary on substantive grounds, because if you look at the nature of the allegations in these two causes of action, it's clear that they've intermingled their direct personal claims with their derivative claims. They, they have the exact same claims in the exact same causes of action. It could not be more clear that it's intermingled. And we've cited the court to cases like the Abrams case from the Court of Appeals, the Barber case from this court, the Udell case from this court. All of those cases stand for the proposition that under these exact circumstances, where it's a hodgepodge of personal claims intermingled with derivative claims, dismissal is indeed mandated. And it's this line of case law uh, moving beyond standing. 
when we get to the substance of the heart of the matter, they have clearly intermingled these claims. And so we respectfully submit, Your Honor, that when you move beyond the procedural, beyond the uh, standing, you get to the heart of the allegations, and they're hopelessly in intermingled. And there's a, a substantial body of case law from this court, which supports the notion that the motion court got it right, ultimately, in dismissing uh, this complaint. Now, when we look at the application to amend, it's clear, Your Honor, that that was a fatally flawed application. Indeed, there is no motion to amend the pleadings. The appellant has not cited to a single case which supports the proposition that this court has the authority to grant a motion to leave to amend the pleadings that's never been made at Nisi Prius. So we submit, Your Honors, that under the totality of the circumstances, you even if you say we don't have the power to allow the plaintiffs to replead. No, Your Honor, uh, the, there's no motion. Normally in a decretal paragraph, it would be order reversed, motion granted, yeah, right? I, I know, I know what right. a decretal paragraph so, looks like. So what, what I'm saying is, is that, <laughs> I'm, I am sure of that, Your Honor. Uh, but my, my point being that there's no motion for this court to grant at this point, uh, which is the relief that's being sought by the appellants on this appeal. They're looking for remote for reversal and having their motion granted. Right. My point is they never made the motion. And when we brought this issue up, you know, we, we can if we choose to, uh, we can search a record and, and grant summary judgment without anybody asking us to do it. That's true, Your Honor. Absolutely, unequivocally, the court has the authority That's to do that. It's a pretty broad piece of power. It, it is, and 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 this court's power is 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 equal to that of the lower court for sure. No, it's broader. Uh, it's broader. And, and has has, has Much every broader. has every what I'm saying as far as factual review power. But but at the end of the day, ultimately, in order to grant a motion, whether in a lower court or the appellate court, a motion has to be made. And in this circumstance, very unique circumstance, I might add, the motion was never made at Nisi Prius. And, and ultimately, that's the fatal flaw with regard to their request for leave to replete. So if the court were to uh, essentially sua sponte grant them leave to replete, this is giving them now a third bite at the apple. They've already pleaded a complaint. They've already put in an amended complaint, attempted to do it in a fatally flawed manner that is equally flawed substantively, if you look at that amended complaint, it suffers from the same defect regarding the intermingling of the uh, causes of action that the first pleading suffered from. So now the court is, is would be giving them a third bite at the apple without there even being a motion for that relief. And we thank submit- Thank you, Counselor. Your, thank you, Your Honors. Mr. Ang? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Once again, this matter was uh, dismissed at the pleading stage. I, um, I agree that uh, the court has uh, the power to- uh, Well, your um, adversary asserts that there was no motion that was made, so therefore there's nothing for us to, uh, to grant or to state well, that- There was, uh, there was a, a, a motion to, um, to, uh, uh, to file an amended complaint. It was not, it was not done with um, a procedural, um, complete procedural compliance, but there seems to have been a lot of errors in terms of the drafting of the complaint, the uh, procedural errors in, in terms of making a motion. I mean, I, I'm well, not really sure what was going on. Yeah, Your Honor, uh, I, I recognize that, and once again, I, I do uh, concede that uh, much of it was uh, inartfully prepared. However, I believe that uh, upon uh, granting of, um, of repleting that uh, these can be corrected. Uh, they can be um, uh, brought to um, the attention of the court in satisfactory fashion. And I think that is the remedy that is appropriate here. And not to dismiss and to throw out the entire matter at this stage. It is at the very initial stage uh, of this proceeding. And I most respectfully request that the court um, consider the relief that has been uh, discussed in the course well, of Council, this. Let me just, what do you say to the very valid point that the derivative and direct claims are mixed in what in that document that you submitted as your proposed amended cleaning? 
There's no <laughs> doubt about that. And if that's the thing you're you're asking to replete on, it's just going to get dismissed again. So well, what do you say to that? However, however uh, those that deserve to be dismissed should be dismissed. Those that are properly framed uh, uh, as individual or, der or derivative claims should survive. Uh, the entire complaint and amended complaint should not be summarily um, thrown out at this stage. There is the ability to separate uh, the, uh, the meritorious and the non-meritorious. I think the authorities that we've cited um, allow that. And that's what I uh, urge, and that is that if, uh, if the court finds as a matter of law, which it is uh, empowered to do, then, um, then dispose of what needs to be disposed of. If you are uh, going to take that task on uh, as you have the ability to do, uh, and, and that which survives shall survive, if that is, if that is the case. Thank you, Counselor. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Right. Next matter up for argument is Nurse versus the, the New York City Department of Education. David Zevin here for the Plaintiff Appellant. Um, this is a sovereign immunity case. It's a case um, specifically involving the special duty rule. And the lower court dismissed it, uh, saying there was no special duty established. Um, there are three separate reasons why the special duty rule um, was established or isn't needed. First of all, General Obligations Law 11-106 creates a distinct right of action um, in favor of police officers, which Nurse was as a police officer employed by the NYPD. And the statute, there is no case that says that if you rely on that statute, that you need to establish a special duty in addition to that statute. That's the first point that, that would allow uh, a reversal. Second point is that even if you conclude that a special duty is required, um, there are three ways to establish special duty. Um, the second way doesn't apply here. The first way is if there is a statute which inures to the benefit of a specific class of people and if the plaintiff is a member of that class. In this case, we have that. General Obligations Law 11-106 serves double duty here, so to speak that it is a statute specifically um, for police officers who are injured in the line of duty. And per uh, Applewhite, there, there are only three ways to establish special duty. That is the first one. The, the point with, with the most confusion is the third prong in Applewhite, which is when the government takes control of a known and dangerous situation that will also establish a special duty. And there, there is some confusion about whether there must be reliance by the plaintiff on any assurances from the government. And there need not be. Applewhite um, versus AccuHealth just says straight out, all you need is the government to assume control of a known and dangerous situation, which they did here in removing the dangerous student from the school um, they took control of that situation. And then again, in ordering nurse to go after her in the hallways, they again took control of it. Well, that's and the question, actually, Counselor. How did they order her to go after this student? The assistant principal, Moore, said to her, go get the student. They, they, he specifically instructed her to apprehend her and to get the situation under control. Those were the words that were spoken to her? Go get the yeah, student? Go get her. Yeah. And so this is your argument is that they're directing her to engage in this activity with this dangerous individual. Correct. That's one of the arguments. The, the other argument is that months prior, this student had uh, assaulted another school safety agent and she had been removed from the school by the Department of Education. And so they also, at that point, took control of a known and dangerous situation. They Mr. Zevin, I'm sorry, Mr. Zevin, this is Judge Shulman. Um, on this record, didn't uh, uh, Peace Officer Nurse um, 
have the ability to assess the situation. She, in fact, had warned her colleagues to be careful with the student, had familiarity with the student, in fact, believed that she was arguably Dr. Phil in potentially having a relationship with the student and getting the student to calm down and be more responsive to direction. At the same time, she had the discretion and the ability because she was in charge. She was the lead person uh, with a special level to be able to, to reach out to the dean of special needs, to be able to get reinforcements, so to speak. So it is in that context that I'm struggling with your ability to claim that you met that other prong of special duty where the principal directed her into a dangerous situation in that circumstance. Okay, you're absolutely right about her assuming control of the situation. She is a person who valued her job very much. And I, I would hate this to be a situation where no good deed goes unpunished. She did believe she was the right person for the job. She did have a uh, knowledge of the student, a better relationship with the student than anyone else. And so she did decide that she would be the best person to be one-on-one -on -one with the student to handle it. Um, that does not negate the fact that the school had previously removed the student from the school, which is taking control of the situation. And it doesn't negate the fact that the school principal ordered Ms. Nurse directly, not any other school safety agent, but Ms. Nurse to go get the student, thereby ordering her into harm's way and taking control of the situation. Thank you. Okay. It's okay. I'm sorry, Judge Gonzalez, you had a question? I was just going to ask, but you would agree that the um, assistant principal didn't tell um, the uh, plaintiff how to get the student or how to apprehend the student? The exact matter, no. It would not be the assistant principal's, it would not be the assistant principal's job to do that. The assistant principal wouldn't have the knowledge of how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Ms. Biarbao, you're arguing? Yes, Your Honor. This is Daniel Matza Brown, Assistant Corporation Counsel for the Respondent, DOE. I think that the first thing to recognize here is that a special duty is undoubtedly required to be shown by the plaintiff. My colleague's description of Section 11-106 simply does not comport with the law's purpose or this court's decisions interpreting that law. The law does not create a distinct right of action in favor of police officers, but it re removes an impediment to them suing the firefighters rule that was created under the common law. So the law's purpose is to put police officers and firefighters on equal footing with other government employees who, as this court is well aware, must indeed show a special duty when they sue a governmental entity. Right? Section 11-106 does not change that. And, and, and we, we know that the appellant is wrong here because on page three of the appellant's brief, they argue that the goal of Section 11-106 was intended to expand common law liability of local governments. But this court in Grogan held exactly the opposite. And it said section 11-106 is not intended to expand the common law liability of local governments. So appellant's reading of the statute is simply wrong. Now, because we know that a special duty is required here, we can look at why the allegations pled and the testimony of Ms. Nurse shows that there was no special duty owed to her by DOE here. So we have a student who has had issues in the school previously who apparently should not have been returned to that school should have gone to another school but because of a quote unquote glitch was in the school and now on the day of the incident um, she is acting up and quote unquote cursing up a storm and there's some kind of uh, altercation a, a verbal altercation i guess on the main floor and then the principal tells plaintiff to quote unquote get the student and uh, the plaintiff tries to get the student. So why is that not? So those are the allegations. Is that correct? That's right, Your Honor. And I'll, I'll start with the, the first that you that you spoke about, about the student being removed as a matter of discretion by the school. 
and then the student being returned for a few days. That set of facts is indistinguishable from what happened in the Morgan Ward case that we cite in our brief, which is a situation where a school is aware of a dangerous situation, as is, as our staff members, and the school does something about it and then ceases to do that thing about it. And the teacher is aware of that. So in Morgan Ward, we had a situation where there was a, a, a floor that was dangerous that a teacher reported to the, the principal. And the principal said, all right, we'll get additional security there. And for a couple of weeks, there was additional security. And then on the day of the plaintiff's injury, in that case, there was no additional security. And the plaintiff nevertheless went into the classroom that she knew was dangerous and was injured, right? And so going to Judge Shulman's remarks, right, there's a lack of causation there. And we have very similar facts here where the student was returned to school. Uh, she, she was returned the day before this incident. The plaintiff knew that the student would be there for three days, right? The principal told her that. And so there, there's, there is, again, a situation where, yes, the school had said something or done something, it was then clear that they were not, not doing that thing for some amount of time. And the plaintiff nevertheless right, uh, engaged the student in the way that you know, Judge Shulman explained. Yes, Judge yes, Judge. Masarelli, I'm sorry, Judge Masarelli, you're muted. You're muted. Are you arguing that the plaintiff did her job and therefore she's liable? It was her nope. job to maintain order. There's a student who's acting out, who's caused potentially a danger to everyone else there. And you're putting the blame on her? Your Honor, no, I'm not putting the blame on her. I'm just, I'm simply looking at, at, at what's required to show a special duty. And a special duty is, 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 is more than a principal simply saying to, a, to the supervisor. It to me of like when you say she nevertheless attempted to quell the student when you say nevertheless to me it sounds like you're trying to say that she's the one she should have just stood by and let all this go on no your honor but but there is a causation there is a causation requirement for a special duty argument right so it, there has to be a link between the injury and what was done here and if, if her argument is simply that the principal said to her who supervises the school safety team that student's acting up, go get her, right? That, that, then there is no limitation on a special duty finding for any interaction with a school safety officer or a student, right? And, and that's, that is problematic under the case law, right? So there, that's different than what you were arguing before. I'm, I, I, I must have mis, misspoken or spoken ineloquently, Your Honor. I'm, I apologize for that. That was not my intent. Um, but, but what I do think is important to recognize is that causation limitation here, right? And, and if, if, all that needs to be done is for a principal to say, uh, go get that student, then we, we have a special duty in every case involving a school safety officer. And that's clearly not the law. Right? Thank you, yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Evan, you have um, two minutes. Thank you. Um, first of all, General Obligations Law 11 106 does quote, create a distinct right of action. That's from Gonzalez v. Iancovello, a distinct right of action in favor of police officers, um, directly contradicting what my opponent just said. Um, and it was intended not necessarily to expand municipal liability, but to expand all liability. This is uh, a common law did not provide liability against anyone or an act of a police officer, or an injury of a police officer in the line of duty. It, then general municipal law 205-E came in to expand liability. There was, as, as you can read um, in my papers, there was a history of uh, statutes enacted to increase liability, to increase the protections for police officers. The statute was very much meant to increase liability, not necessarily for municipalities, but for everyone. Um, Thank you, Councilor. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Councillor. Next matter is People v. Zoltan Garokas. Gar Gar Good afternoon. Gabe Newland from the Office of the Appellate Defender on behalf of Zoltan Gorox. Gorox, thank you. Gorox, Jenna. This case calls for a straightforward application of People v. Gelati, People v. Johnson, 
in this court's recent decision in People versus Gonzalez. As in Gonzalez, this is a case where the technically correct assessment of points under risk factors three and seven resulted in an overassessment of the actual risk of recidivism, as the Board of Examiners recognized in this case when it recommended a level one for Mr. Gorox. Notably, the defendant in Gonzalez, whom this court described as being at the very uh, low end of the spectrum for child pornography offenders, possessed more than seven times as many images as Mr. Gorox, who is an aging first-time sexual offender with a graduate degree in business, no history of violent behavior. It's, uh, are, we, are we to also uh, look at the content, uh, the, the, the type of photograph, rather than just the sheer number? I mean, in, in this particular case, we have photographs of children as young as four years old who are uh, uh, engaging in uh, sexual activities, uh, being presumably being forced to do so. Um, so it's it's not we, we don't just count up and say if you have 15 photos you're one level, if you have 50 you're another level. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to evaluate the factors in a much more particular manner. That's correct. And, and risk factor five already accounts for for the fact that. These indeed were uh, child victims who were younger than 11 years old. That's already incorporated into into one part of the risk assessment risk assessment instrument. And you know, I don't mean to suggest that was this wasn't a you know a serious event that Mr. Gorak shouldn't be on the registry at all. But the question here is, you know, does he present a, a low risk to the public or a moderate risk? And um, Given the content of these images and the number of the images, Mr. Gorox, um, as the board recognized, is is a low risk to the public. As you know, the guidelines. The council, he didn't didn't the uh, defendant share these images? Didn't he post them on Twitter? Isn't it more than just viewing them, more than just possessing them? That's, and wasn't he 65 years old when he did all of this? Uh, I'll take your questions in turn, Your Honor. To the to the first. Point, there is absolutely no evidence that Mr. Gorox disseminated these images. That's something that the prosecutor said several times, but there's Mr. Gorox was never charged in the underlying case with disseminating images. He was he was charged with possessing 21 images and he pled to two images. Um, the prosecutor at the SOAR hearing attempted to, to refer to some pieces of paper. Um, that suggested that there was dissemination, but the, the court, I think, correctly did not uh, admit that. I think, you know, the court said things like, quote, the DA data sheet is a repeat of the paper written by the DA. It's not evidence that he did something. Or the court said, I'm now being asked through a backdoor mechanism to punish him, not for crimes he was convicted of, but for the crimes the people were not able to move forward with. The prosecution never even attempted to put that evidence before a grand jury. So the evidence before this court uh, is that Mr. Gorox had 21 images, he pled to two. So this counsel, is, this is Judge Scarpula. You're not disputing that he is correctly, he was correctly by the lower court um, scored as a level two. You're not disputing that. He, I'm not disputing that the-, the You want correct. us to exercise our interest of justice jurisdiction to move him down? That's correct. He, he was, Tech, presumptive level two that score. He never actually uh, did. He actually ever admit that it was his pornography that he was looking at. He did both at the the underlying plea hearing and I at the. He, really, I thought that there was something about he uh, he said it it was uh, someone else's laptop. I I think he he did make a remark about that. Um, earlier in the context of, of the criminal case, but ultimately the the issue of acceptance of responsibility was litigated before the SORA court and, and the court um, observed that you know, Mr. Gorex had, had pleaded guilty in the underlying criminal case. He completed an 18 month treatment program in prison that requires one to accept responsibility. And at the SORA hearing itself, Mr. Gorex explained that he was horrified by his own behavior. He apologized to the court, the victims, his family and his friends. He was but in the, in the court ultimately decided to, to not assign any points for failure to accept responsibility. Um, Mr. Gorox was certainly remorseful for his conduct here. Um, 
Turning to to the you second part. You can touch part. that on rebuttal, counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, people. Good afternoon, Rachel Bond for the people. Uh, may it please the court. Um, defendant's risk level two adjudication here was entirely proper and should not be reduced on appeal. Um, he has demonstrated no special circumstances that would warrant a downward departure. Um, defendant argues that he is at a lesser likelihood of committing a hands-on offense in the future. Um, however, the types of images that he was looking at require those types of hands-on offenses to be committed. Um, and therefore, the, the magnitude of harm that's inflicted if he were to reoffend is incredibly high. Um, and we think that that is the most important factor here, is that the magnitude of harm here would be incredibly high. Defendant possessed heinous and vulgar images of young children performing sex acts on adults. Um, so any reoffense contributes to the demand for those kinds of images. Um, additionally, he claims uh, that because he was um, an aging first-time sex offender, that he should be entitled to a downward departure. Um, however, as this court just stated and People v. Rivera decided on November 24th, uh, a defendant's advanced age doesn't necessarily render him less likely to reoffend, especially that argument sort of falls apart when they are already in that aging category at the time they commit their first offense. Um, and defendant also hasn't presented any sort of evidence that he personally is less likely to reoffend based on his age or his health. Um, your, your adversary made reference to People v. Gonzalez. Yes. What is the what is your um, uh, read on uh, Gonzalez and its applicab applicability to this case? Uh, so in People v. Gonzalez, I believe this court had stated that Gonzalez was the type of case that was. Uh, pictured by Gelati when uh, worrying about when to take a downward departure for these types of child pornography cases. And I think that this case and Gonzalez are only similar on the most surface level reading of the cases. Uh, for example, in uh, People v. Gonzalez, the prosecutor had uh, said that they were not contesting a non-prison sentence, whereas here the offer was for one and a half to three years for each photo. Uh, to run consecutively, which defendant accepted. Um, the, the probation department in Gonzalez didn't recommend a prison sentence, whereas the probation department here did. Um, and in Gonzalez, the defendant had no criminal history, whereas the defendant here, although this was his first sex offense, he had two drunk driving convictions in New York and multiple federal convictions as well. So he's no stranger to the criminal justice system, unlike the defendant in Gonzalez. Um, and so that is our position, that Gonzalez is not the same case here, that the two cases are very different in terms of the defendant, and that is why this defendant is not entitled to a downward departure. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Thank you very much. Mr. Newland? Yes, Your Honor. Just, of, of course, as, as Mr. Gorax recognized at the SOAR hearing, possessing child pornography is very harmful. We're not contesting that. But again, as this court recognized in Gonzalez, in, in that case where the defendant possessed approximately 150 images, you know, that's, at, as the court has recognized, this is at the low end um, of the spectrum for a child pornography case. And Mr. Gorax possessed far fewer images than that. And this isn't the sort of case where he was um, possessing images and, and, and categorizing them and doing the sorts of things that lead the board to recommend an upward departure. The board in this case thought that Mr. Gorax was a low risk to the public, and so did the Board of Parole when it granted his release at his first appearance bef before the parole board. It thought he wasn't a risk to the public. Uh, and so in this case, in light of all of these circumstances, Mr. Gorax is an aging first-time sexual offender. Uh, the court should grant a downward departure to a level one. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, counselors. Next matter is uh, United Natural versus Goldman Sachs. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, David Cooper on behalf of UNFI, the United Natural Foods, Inc. The complaint here establishes that defendants, Goldman Sachs entities, breached their agreement with UNFI, acted in bad faith, and made misrepresentations to UNFI, all in order to increase their fees and manipulate the CDS market. Supreme Court dismissed these claims largely on legal grounds that defendants now abandon because they conflict with the agreement or settle precedent from this court. 
And so what we're left with are defendants' new arguments, which simply refuse to accept as true the allegations of the complaint. Those arguments should be rejected, and the claims for breach of contract, breach for the implied covenant, and fraud should be reinstated. To begin with, the Supreme Court erred in dismissing the claim for breach of contract for $40.5 million in marketing period fees. And there are two independent bases for the breach here. The first is that the marketing period ended before the acquisition closed. And here the Supreme Court correctly held that there was, quote, clearly a marketing period that started on September 24th and ended on October 15th before the closing. And this is the critical point. Defendants do not dispute that if Supreme Court is correct, then even if there was a second marketing period, there would still be a breach here because a marketing period ended before the acquisition closed. What was the October 22nd um, um, closing? Wasn't there an October 22nd closing? The closing was on October 22nd, yes, that's correct. And our position and what Supreme Court accepted was that there was a marketing period starting on September 24th and ending on October 15th before the closing. What defendants argue is that there was only one marketing period and that that marketing period began on October 15th. The problem with defendants' argument is this is something that they invented at the 11th hour. They first raised this issue two days before the closing, close to midnight, when they previously recognized and treated the, uh, the September 24th period as the marketing period. And in fact, that was the only period when, in which actual marketing occurred. And that is why Supreme Court found that that was, in fact, a marketing period. Where Supreme Court October made- 15, Was October 15th the day that the financial statement was delivered? So, so is that why they were arguing that that was the, the starting day, the October 15th day? Uh, so there were two different financial statements. One was issued on September 24th, another one on October 15th. But a critical point here is that even by on October 17th, even on October 17th, Goldman Sachs did not seek marketing period fees and never suggested that the September 24th period was not a marketing period. It was only two days before, two business days before the closing that they invented this argument. And to be clear, after October 15th, the period that Goldman Sachs now says was the marketing period, there was no marketing at all. So the parties understood what the marketing period was. They marketed during that period. And at the absolute minimum, there's an ambiguity there that precludes dismissal on the pleadings. But even aside from that, there was a, independently a breach of contract because the defendants did not act in good faith to complete a successful syndication. The Supreme Court's rationale here was that defendants' motive was not improper simply because they were seeking profit. But defendants abandoned this argument, again. Defendants' new argument principally is that there's no counsel, good faith required. Counsel, were the defendants required to syndicate? I thought that they reserved the right to syndicate. So what the, so the agreement says in many, many places that there was, in fact, an obligation to syndicate. And I'll call this court's attention to page 313 of the records. Quote, lead agreements, agree, lead arrangers agreements to syndicate the facilities. Page 309. UNFI must assist the lead arrangers in completing the syndications. Page 308, defendants have the roles of lead arranger with the rights and responsibilities associated with that role. I thought the obligation was to fund the loan and that they had the, and they reserved the right to syndicate. No, that's not, it's true that they had an obligation for, to do the loan, that is correct. They also had an obligation to syndicate as shown in all of those provisions. The only provision that Goldman cites supposedly to the contrary is this one that says reserve the right. But what it says, and this is page 308 of the record, they reserve the right to syndicate to certain investors. So that's not saying they reserve the right to syndicate, period. It's they reserve the right to syndicate to certain investors. There's no suggestion that reserving the right to syndicate to certain investors mean that they can choose not to syndicate at all and make no good faith effort to syndicate. But, but counsel, is there any language that says shall syndicate or will syndicate? as opposed to may syndicate? Well, page 313 says that they have agreements to syndicate the facilities. So I think that's pretty clear that that means that they are agreeing to syndicate the facilities. And page 308, that they have the rights and responsibilities of the lead arranger, the role of the lead arranger is to syndicate. And so at the very least, at the very least, there's an ambiguity there that would suggest that there was a good faith obligation to syndicate. But again, um, that only comes into- I'm sorry, Mr. Cooper. I mean, I counsel. Say, only come, sorry, I, excuse me. This is Judge Shulman. Um, in in your argument, um, I, I'm interested in the fraud claim. Um, didn't the plaintiff have the ability to um, 
demand a, the, a final list of the investors uh, and um, they would have been put on notice as to the, uh, the so-called hedge fund uh, group uh, who were um, dealing with the um, credit default swaps. Um, you, you had that ability to do that and your client chose not to. You had an earlier list. Um, so you could have, my, my point is, is I don't really see any facts in the pleading as to justifiable reliance. So it's true that UNFI could ask for a final list of the investors, but what that final list would not told them is the CDS positions of those investors. And that's the critical point. They could have gotten the list, but the list wouldn't have said, the CDS market is opaque. Goldman Sachs knows who has positions in that market. UNFI does not and has no ability, no practical ability to do so. And that's why there was reasonable reliance here and why it's a factual issue that should not have been decided on the pleadings. And Supreme Court's decision here was based on just a misunderstanding that we were looking at the debt of super value rather than the CDS of super value. But I see my time is close to, uh, as close to concluded. So I do want to also get to briefly to the implied covenant claim because it is a crucial one where they exercise the all of the flex provisions to increase the interest by $180 million. And Supreme Court held that this was duplicative, ignoring two critical points. One, which is that if you dismiss a breach of contract claim, you cannot dismiss a breach of implied covenant claim as duplicative. And second, that it was based on entirely separate provisions of the agreement, whereas the breach of contract claim was based on page 378 of the record, you'll see the provision dealing with marketing period fees. And on page 380, just before paragraph A, you'll see the provision dealing with the flex provisions. They are completely separate provisions leading to completely separate damages, four and a half million dollars in fees versus $180 million in interest. And so it should not have been dismissed as duplicative and it along with the other claims should be reinstated. Thank you very much, Counselor. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Michael Paskin from Cravath for the respondents. May it please the court. Um, yeah, let me yeah. try to, good afternoon. Let me try to take through very quickly the issues that Mr. Cooper covered. Um, as an introduction though, you know, UNFI here is a highly sophisticated New York Stock Exchange listed company represented by Skadden Arps in this deal, which was to acquire super value for $3, million, for $3 billion with um, financing arranged by Goldman Sachs and other banks. Um, paragraph 21 of the complaint, record page 172, UNFI admits that, quote, all of the benefits it anticipated from the acquisition and more will be fully realized. That's the context in which in which this dispute arises. So, counsel, this is Judge Scarpula. What do you say to counsel's argument that you were required to syndicate? Well, I say that that's completely wrong, Your Honor. Um, Why? <laughs> syn 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 syndication is, is a right, not an obligation. And we go through in our briefing, you know, the, the appropriate analysis of the contract language. But rather than rehashing what our briefs say, the one other thing that I would like to direct Your Honor's attention to is UNFI's own complaint. Paragraph 28 of their complaint, which is page 175 in the record, says, quote, Notwithstanding the millions in fees it earned for committing the funds, Goldman Bank did not necessarily have to loan them to UNFI. Goldman Bank had the option to syndicate all or a portion of its commitment to fund the term loan. That's UNFI's pleading, Your Honor. That is not, that is not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm making up. That's what UNFI said in its complaint. And Mr. Cooper's argument tries to walk completely away from that. Turning to the question, thank you, Your Honor. Turn, turning the, to the question. Reliance, let's just go through reliance. Why Why shouldn't they have relied? On the fraud the claim, fraud Your Honor? Claim, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, with respect to the fraud claim, the, the issue of reliance, Mr. Cooper's argument, you know, depends on the notion that this is an, a question that is in Goldman's peculiar knowledge. And the way he even just described it, that's not the case. The issue well, he is says the syndication market is opaque and only Goldman Sachs knows what those CDO, what those uh, companies, what kind of uh, secure or packaged securities they're holding. Is that well, correct? It, 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 no, Your Honor. Let, let's let's grant Mr. Cooper the idea, which is not well pled and is not pled with particularity, but let's grant him for argument's sake that that Goldman Sachs knows about 
whether some of its own clients may hold certain CDS positions in another part of the, the organization. If UNFI's true concern was about investors who held CDS positions that they might not like to be their lenders for the term loan, they know that that exists regardless of whether those investors are Goldman Sachs clients or Morgan Stanley clients or JP Morgan clients or anybody else's clients out there. And they have sophisticated advisors who can advise them that if they wanted to deal with that issue and make sure to exclude those advisors, there were tools available. Could they, have requested, could they have requested a copy of the list of advisors? They, they could have requested. And the, the well, investors have it. They, they could have requested, they, they did have a copy of the list of investors and they don't allege that there was any difference in the list that they received from the one that ultimately represented the, the investors at closing. The point that I would add to that, Your Honor, is that the, the tools that were available to them, unlike, for example, um, the DDJ management case that they, that they cite, they could, if they cared about this issue before the closing, they could have asked for representations and warranties in the contract saying that the investors will not have certain attributes. Counsel, they let's could just ask you this, were the syndicators only Goldman Sachs clients or were they other, were they clients of other um, investment the investors, you mean? No, the investors I'm are sorry, sold out. The, the investors are are out there in the in the public, and they're not only Goldman Sachs clients. There's a so there. Some of them you wouldn't have any special information uh, about anyway, correct? Pre precisely, Your Honor. Okay. Precisely, Your Honor. The the one other issue on the fraud claim that I'd like to address is the is the is the prong of injury, because in UNFI's reply brief, they completely ignore the Lama v. Smith Barney case, which the from the Court of Appeals, which we cited in our opposition and they didn't respond to. And in that case, Lama the plaintiff was a Smith Barney shareholder, and they claimed that they were defrauded into consenting to a Smith Barney merger with another with another institution. And that the injury that they say they suffered is that they had a large tax liability when that deal happened. And that if they had been able to insert themselves into the process, they could have forced a different kind of deal structure that would have saved them a lot of money in, in taxes. What the Court of Appeals stated is, quote, the loss of an alternative contractual bargain, which there was a different structure to the merger, cannot serve as a basis for fraud damages because the loss of the bargain was undeterminable and speculative. That's exactly what we have here, Your Honors. Here, their alleged injury is that is that the group of investors that, that ultimately are the lenders for the term loan is not a group that they liked and they would have preferred to have a different group of investors. That is exactly the kind of alternative bargain that is undeterminable and speculative that Lama says cannot support a fraud claim as a matter of law, and that issue is dispositive. In fact, this case is even more speculative than Lama because at least in the Lama case, the, the tax liability had already happened, where here it's based on sort of a chain of their own speculation about which they don't plead with particularity about who these investors might be and what sorts of actions they might take in the future that are going to be detrimental to UNFI's interests. I would, I would like to turn very quickly to um, the, the flex provisions and the implied covenant claim. You have one minute. Thank you, Your Honor. The one case that I would like to focus the court's attention on is, the, is another controlling precedent from the Court of Appeals in the EBC-1 v. You know, Goldman Sachs case. It's another Goldman Sachs case. It's directly on point for the proposition that there cannot be a breach of the implied covenant where the principal purpose of the contract is achieved. In the EBC-1 case, Goldman Sachs was the lead underwriter who did an IPO for the, for the company eToys, which subsequently went bankrupt. The principal purpose of the IPO was to create a public market for the stock and to increase working capital for the company. The allegation that was alleged to, to breach the, uh, the, the, the implied covenant was that Goldman priced the IPO too low, which meant that the company got less proceeds and Goldman allegedly profited by selling the stock in the, in the aftermarket. That's exactly what happens here. Here, they say, here UNFI wishes that it could have paid a lower rate by, getting a, by, by not having the flex provisions. 
and they say that you know what happened is that they they have to pay more on their financing but there is no doubt that the principal purpose of the contract which was to provide the financing for them to do this acquisition that was achieved and back to the complaint paragraph 21 where they say all the benefits they anticipated and more will be realized the their plaintiffs attempt to distinguish EBC one is it you know fails because they say that there was no harm that was alleged there no monetary harm but of course there was that's that's nonsensical because in that case eToys said that they received less from the IPO than they should have received if it had been priced properly that's exactly what happens here here they're saying that they are paying more interest than if the than if the flex provisions hadn't been ex exercised EBC one is direct Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. The next matter is uh, Abe or AB versus NYU. Yes, thank you. This is Jennifer Unruh for the plaintiff, Koya Abe, the, the appellant. Abe, thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, this concerns the award of monetary sanctions as attorney fees against a disadvantaged person, the amount of $126,435. Um, we're arguing that this is objectively an excessive fine against a poor person for the acts involved. Um, in this in this court's uh, recent decision, just this past July, in uh, Property Clerk NYCPD versus Nurse, uh, this court recognized that the economic circumstances of the defendant or the the person who is affected by these uh, fines or penalties. Uh, must be considered in determining whether that is an excessive penalty. And that was quoting, I believe it's uh, County of Nassau versus Canavan from the Court of Appeals. Um, Mr. Abe is a disadvantaged Counsel, person. Counsel, um, are you conceding that the sanction in and of itself was appropriate? Uh, no, we're not. We, we believe that Mr. Abe acted in good faith. He did not have bad intent. And so there's the issue of both of the same what about the release of unredacted documents that the defendants had deemed confidential what do you say there uh there was a number of factors involved in that um the documents involved uh were filed in good faith uh we had uh, relied upon the statements of justice braun who was the judge uh, during when these things had come up who had indicated that that particular confidentiality order the defendants have relied upon was in fact not in effect in the in the consolidated action. And separately, uh, there was also a written agreement, a stipulation between the parties that it did not apply. Um, that's in the record at 22, uh, I'm sorry, 2344. So Mr. Abbey was under the belief that he was doing nothing wrong. And he did, in fact, redact some of the sensitive information from those documents, but he did not believe that they were confidential within the meaning of all these other things that had happened in the in the proceeding before that. But um, to penalize him in the amount of one hundred twenty six thousand uh, dollars, he has he's not well. He's fifty six years old. He's, if this a judgment is entered, he's going to be seventy six. Um, there's huge collateral consequences for an individual like him. Um, these kinds of things affecting credit can affect his ability to get employment in the future. Do you they acknowledge that the that the attorney's fees could have been higher because, in fact, what was charged here by the law firm was a reduced rate? Well, in terms of this particular in other words, issue, there already a discount. Uh, we don't know because we actually saw some evidence of that um, in the hearing and we and we weren't able to get it. We had wanted to ask some questions of different individuals who had those facts and we weren't allowed to to uh, to um, speak with those individuals that could have confirmed that or not confirmed that um, on NYU's side, for example. And then there's also the issue of the double reimbursement, which we couldn't get any testimony on either. Um, but as for Mr. Abe, there is the issue the intent has to be considered as well. And it was his belief at the time that he was doing what he was supposed to be doing and all these things. Um, he, he was not doing anything malicious. He was trying to recover his lost wages. Uh, the, the New York Department of Labor agreed with Mr. Abe that NYU had withheld his wages. And that was part of some of the claims that were dismissed in the 2016 
action for which is, which is part of this as well. Um, his his belief was that he was he was trying to recover for his injuries, um, and it's just just grossly disproportionate to the gravity of what he was doing. He's not a criminal. He was simply trying to remedy these injuries that he had. Um, it didn't turn out well, but that was his that was his intent purely to do that. Um, I and would so also like to know under what what authority would we have to make a finding that the that the amount should be lowered? Uh, th their invoices were produced as to the amount of the attorney's fees. So, what authority would we have to say no that it's it's too high? Well, in the hearing with the referee, this was the defendant's burden to prove these amounts in the first place. Um, and they decided to rely upon a spreadsheet that was made specific for the hearing. Uh, there is no contemporaneous time records of the work they allegedly did. And um, there's, a, there's a decision on point in this, ca in this case, and it's 135th East 57th Street, where it says a special referee erred in admitting a spreadsheet into evidence as a business record um, that was prepared for the use for the purpose of the hearing. Uh, it wasn't a business record. It shouldn't have been relied upon. But the other problem that is here is there's simply nothing in the record. Uh, it wasn't filed. It apparently wasn't submitted. There's um, there's actually, I don't believe there's any documentation in the record itself as to what these itemized things were. And based upon recollection, some of them involved um, a TRO that was never filed. There's there's some other things in there that raise questions, but I'm not even sure I if the documentation. The I, have. I thought the spreadsheet uh, uh, was uh, a a uh, it was reduced it reduced invoices line by line as to what had a what uh, the hours spent, what the hours uh, spent on in terms of the the person who performed the work, what the work was that was being performed, and it was simply a tally of the relevant uh, invoices. There, there was no actual time records, though, and that's what is required is the contemporaneous time records. Um, okay, they, Cass, so you have time on uh, rebuttal. Yes, you have two minutes on rebuttal. Okay. I'll hear from um, who's representing uh, NYU in this. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Justice Weber. This is Evan Parnas from DLA Piper on behalf of the respondents, NYU and the individual respondents. The Supreme Court's order confirming JHO Schlesinger's recommendation and report that defendants should be awarded their attorney's fees should be affirmed for, for three reasons. Uh, first, uh, and this goes to a question, uh, a couple of questions that went to plaintiff's counsel, the underlying sanctions award has already been affirmed by this court. So this court in a February 2019 decision already affirmed that the defendants were entitled to reimbursement for their reasonable attorney's fees as sanctions against appellant for engaging in certain frivolous conduct, filing a, a new lawsuit after he was denied leave to amend in a, in a different lawsuit, and then filing hundreds of confidential documents in violation of a confidentiality order. So, and that order that this court already affirmed just had the amount of the fees to be determined by a JHO on a, on a reference, a, a hearing report reference. And the JHO uh, and the record before the JHO demonstrates that there was live witness testimony from defense counsel uh, contrary to appellant's counsel's um, uh, statements here today, there were invoices, detailed monthly invoices that were submitted to the JHO. Those are at the at record 2325 to 2330 with detailed line, line, line by line entries of the time that was spent by defense counsel on these various motions that were warranted by plaintiff engaging in what the court already determined was frivolous conduct. Uh, your adversary was, made reference to certain motions that um, were indicated, but apparently were never actually filed. That, Your Honor, I'm not sure what um, Appellant's counsel was referring to there. Uh, the, the record was clear that we were ordered our to be awarded our attorney's fees on two different motions, one on the motion to dismiss, the other on the order to show cause to seal documents, confidential documents that were improperly filed. They're the only fees that we are requesting and that we submitted the invoices for before the JHO were for those two motions out of the, there's probably been 30 plus motions that uh, appellant's counsel has filed. The only ones we're seeking attorney's fees for are these two motions, which were properly before the JHO. We have live witness testimony on 
uh, on the work that was performed. The JHO found that defense counsel was, was a credible witness and the Supreme Court order said that the reviewed the record and said, I'm quoting, the transcript and evidence induced at the hearing reveals that JHO Schlesinger's award of reasonable attorney's fees is fully supported by the record. Uh, this, this, the, this record included a, a 60 page complaint um, that was improperly filed as an end run around uh, a prior order not to amend in a different action. Then they amended with an 80 page complaint with 11 causes of action. Uh, the, the court's decision below recognized the voluminous filings that the court and the and defendants had to sift through, which amply supported the time that was ch that was charged at a reduced yeah, rate. And there was testimony really as well. Should, should we be considering, as uh, your opposing counsel asked us to, the uh, financial and uh, medical condition of the uh, defendant? I'm sorry, the plaintiff. I mean, well, 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 we're certainly sympathetic to the the plaintiffs. Um, condition. We cite cases in our in our brief at 41 to 43 that attorneys' fees awards are are routinely granted by New York courts without regard to uh, a party's financial status. And you know, in, in the, the the property clerk versus nurse case that appellant's counsel cites is in the context of a of a civil forfeiture action. Um, I think plaintiff's counsel cites the Eighth Amendment's uh, prohibition against excessive fines, but her own case law from the U.S. Supreme Court makes clear that the Eighth Amendment only applies to fines that are levied by and collected on behalf of the government, which is not the case here with attorney's fees against uh, a party. It, it, allowing a, a party to continually engage in vexatious and frivolous litigation with impunity uh, just because they may have certain financial conditions, uh, it continues to harm the, the resources of the court. It's un, unfair to um, to defendants, and you know, while while we certainly are sympathetic to wh whatever condition plaintiff may have, that doesn't allow him to harass and engage in vexatious litigation, which this court already affirmed warranted sanctions against the plaintiff. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you. Uh, yes, you have uh, two minutes on rebuttal. Uh, thank you. I would just like to uh, clarify that as to the two different actions that the claims in the 2016 action for which he was sanctioned actually had a number of new claims that had absolutely nothing to do with anything that had been sought to be amended to another complaint before, just as a point there. Um, I, I do wanna specify that there is uh, some serious human rights issues here in terms of the statue and chilling effect upon other individuals uh, that may seek to remedy discrimination they believe that they are being um, subjected to. The the rule for sanctions uh, should be construed uh, strictly and narrowly, not broadly, and it should not be used to essentially annihilate a human being's opportunity in life and his future well-being. And that is the result here. If a judgment's entered for this amount of money, that's going to follow him till he's at least 76 years old. It's going to be on his credit. There is no way he can pay it. It is absolutely futile for the defendants to be seeking this kind of anything from him. It, there's no point in it. It is a waste of the court's resources because I have to protect my client. It's it's very damaging to him. And I would hope that they would see the light and just simply discontinue this. This action was we're all brought in good faith. It was very serious issues. It's complex. But you know, we're here pretty much at the end, just about. And uh, I would hope that the defendants would would see some light and and hope that the court will reverse this and and consider the human factors involved here. And the lack of the lack of malicious intent on his, and the fact that it's it's really just a procedural issue. Thank you very much, Counselor. Thank you very much. Next matter is People v. Christopher Santana. Gabe Newland from the Office of the Appellate Defender on behalf of Mr. Santana. For a young man like Mr. Santana, a sentence of eight years in prison and five years of post-release supervision is already long enough to accomplish the goals of criminal punishment. It's a serious response to a serious crime. Reducing Mr. Santana's 10-year prison sentence in this case would advance the interest of justice in three different ways. First, so it would Mr. Santana pled guilty to what, Counselor? What charge did he plead guilty to? He pled guilty to attempt uh, first-degree assault, Your Honor. And the maximum would have been what? He was facing a sentencing range of 7 to 15 years. So the max would have been 15. And he, what was the initial promise to him at the time that he entered the plea? So at the, the court offered seven years, the minimum sentence based on, on the facts of this case. Um, and ultimately, Mr. Santana 
didn't appear for sentencing. Um, he had been released on bail. While he was on bail, he was he was working um, and he was attending an anger management class. When he didn't show up for sentencing, of course, he lost the seven year deal. Um, but we think that, you know, even if um, his failure to return for court warrants some additional time on the underlying assault conviction, it doesn't warrant three additional years of prison. We think a, a one year increase of his prison sentence accounts for his for his failure to return. How long was he out on the warrant? How long uh, was he out before he uh, was brought back in for sentencing? After the his failure to return for sentencing, I believe it was approximately two weeks. Um, and, it, uh, you know, as Mr. Santana explained when he was brought back, he um, he was panicking. He was he was afraid of being separated from his family. And, you know, as we explain in our brief, and, his and counsel didn't didn't the um, defendant fail to surrender peaceably? Didn't he actually flee the the warrant officers? That that's what the prosecutor said. I, so that's no another consideration that's factored in by the sentencing judge, right? That's correct. And and again, we think that, um, you know, given all the circumstances here, particularly where Mr. Santana is is very young, um, his his failure to appear for sentencing is, is the sort of impulsive, high-risk, stupid decision that one might expect from someone who's only 20 years old, whose brain is not fully developed. Uh, he, he explained that he was very sorry for not coming back. And uh, I think that given Mr. Santana's youth in this case, given the fact that he was um, otherwise on a, on a positive trajectory while he was released in, on bail, that a one-year increase of his prison sentence from the original deal is, is a more appropriate response than increasing his prison sentence by three years. So if, there's, if there are no further questions from the court, we ask that you reduce Mr. Santana's prison sentence from 10 years to eight years. Thank you. Thank you. People? Uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. Michael Yetter for the people. Um, there's no reason to reduce defendant's sentence on appeal. Um, of course, as you noted, he faced 15 years on the attempted first degree assault charge, and he was able to negotiate with the court down to the minimum term of seven years. Uh, all that was required well, of him. Counsel, well, what is the penological benefit of increasing his sentence three years? Well, I, I think it's it's based upon his actions in this case and his criminal history and his total disregard for uh, court's time and, and for the. Well, those are all factors made. to be considered. But what's what's the penological benefit? How how does the system benefit? How is he going to benefit from the additional three years? Well, I, I think you know the the factors: incapacitation, uh, possibility for reformation in prison, uh, protection of society, th things of that nature. Uh, Your Honor. Um, and one thing I, I just would like to clarify. Would fact that, that be served? I'm sorry, uh, but wouldn't that be served as well by increasing the sentence one year over the plea bargain? I mean, the people were agreeable to a plea bargain, if I'm correct, of seven years. Is that correct? I, I, we, we ultimately were. I believe we recommended a little bit more time, but the judge uh, offered seven. Right. And and we were, and yeah. yeah, you didn't uh, object to that. So right. he was missing for two weeks. Uh, why wouldn't it be appropriate to just increase that sentence one year rather than three years? It's not like he went out for a year and he committed four or five more crimes. Then I could understand uh, more easily your position uh, in asking, you asked for 12 years, I believe, when he came back, an increase of four years. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, an increase of five years. My math is a little slow, I guess. Uh, but uh, it, it kind of confuses me about why uh, the sentence should be increased to the level uh, that it is? How, how does it benefit society? Well, I think for the reasons we've been discussing, as far as defendant's conduct, it wasn't just that he forgot about the-, the No, he didn't date. forget. I'm not saying he right. forgot. He, 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 he purposely didn't show up and he stayed out for two weeks. And then when the warrant squad went to pick him up, he tried to flee again. So this was a person who was repeatedly and expressly told by the court that he could be sentenced up to 15 years total if he didn't uh, appear um, as required at the status conference, not the sentencing proceeding, because this was just a status conference. It was not the sentencing proceeding. And, you know, so the judge was very clear. This person knew that he was facing up to 15 years in prison and the Counsel, judge made the determination. This, this defendant had a, a prior conviction, right, for attempted robbery in the second degree in 2013 when he was 17 years old. Is that right? 
That's correct. And and here he was charged with initially he um, the indictment was his charge was for three three counts of attempted assault one. Um, this was a box cutter slashing at a at a nightclub where three people were injured. Yes, those are those were the allegations uh, in the indictment in the, in the complaint. I believe there was some discussion that possibly there were only two victims uh, on page two of the plea transcript, but it's not entirely clear to me what that means. That was a statement by the court. Um, but yeah, there were three people alleged to have been cut by the box cuts. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Newland, you have um, one minute of rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Just um, briefly, as for as Mr. Santana's criminal history, I just note that that previous conviction when he was 17 is already incorporated into the sentence in the sense that the, the minimum increased from three and a half years to seven years because of that uh, predicate conviction when he was 17. Um, and again, we don't think that we think that three years is an excessive response for his for his failure to appear um, in this particular case, and that one year already adequately advances the goals of criminal punishment. Mr. Santana is, you know, he's made some mistakes when he's young, but he was on a positive trajectory when he was out on bail and keeping him in prison for two additional years will uh, will re reduce his life expectancy and it will keep him separated from his son. And we ask the court to reduce the sentence by two years. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Trafalette versus Sapola and uh, Trafalette versus Trafalet. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Eric Ruthius for the appellant. May I reserve two minutes of my seven minutes for rebuttal? Did you want to argue them together? Or you want to do them separately? I think it's probably easier to do them separately, if that's okay, okay. with the court. So you have five and two then. That's on um, 02323. Three. Yes. And if we want to talk about the other one, I, could, I would request four and one. Okay. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Okay. The law is plain that if a party is going to be compelled to arbitrate claims against her will, that her agreement to arbitrate must be clear, it must be explicit, and it must be unequivocal, and it, and it must not depend on implication or subtlety. In other words, there can be no doubt that she agreed to arbitrate the dispute. Now, that rule applies with special force in the matrimonial context where attorneys are not allowed to force their clients to arbitrate disputes against them on the theory that they are particularly vulnerable clients, not likely to understand what important rights they're giving up in arbitration. Therefore, both the law maintaining mandating that arbitration provisions must be free from doubt and the public policy protecting matrimonial clients from arbitration require reversal of the lower so courts. What was it about the terms and conditions of the retainer agreement that was uh, unclear or ambiguous that stated that the parties agreed to settle such dispute or claim by arbitration? Right. So what's ambiguous there is um, it refers to the parties and it says that um, counsel and the parties uh, agreed to arbitrate a dispute. It does not define who the parties are. And if in fact it was meant to include Ms. Traffley, my client, as the respondent is suggesting, it would have said that counsel and client, she's a defined term, agreed to arbitrate. But it doesn't so say that. She, so in other words, you're stating that she read this to mean that if there were issues between the attorneys, that they would have to, if they had an issue because something occurred, that they would have to arbitrate, but it had nothing to do with her claims or with her case? No, what I'm suggesting is that the what she read it to imply is a, an agreement between her counsel, who is retaining this forensic accountant to, to provide forensic accounting services at the, at the counsel's direction in order to preserve a privilege, and those two were the contracting parties in this agreement. And we think that's reinforced if you look at the agreement itself. I'm referring to page 81 counsel, of the record. Didn't she, counsel, this is Judge Scarpola, didn't she sign the agreement as the financially responsible party? She did sign as financially responsible. And isn't it true that if there was a dispute over financial stuff that she would be the one that would have to pay? Yes, but that's- Are you saying that the law firm and the other party, the law firm who had, who, who didn't have that obligation to pay would have arbitrated, would have had to arbitrate without her? Does that make any real sense? 
We think it does because this is an agreement where the and the even though she signed the part of the agreement that said right below above or below where it said, and I understand everything about this agreement, including the dispute re resolution sections, you're still making that argument. Yes, because all that dispute okay. resolution provision provides is that there's an agreement between counsel and the client. I mean, where it's most clear is in the second sentence of the dispute resolution provision, where it says that Cipolla and counsel, just two parties agreed to this exclusive remedy. That we think is quite clear. And if you look at um, page 81 of the record, there's a section on liability where there's a sentence talking about limiting liability. And that um, provision says that um, the parties will not in any event, be liable to the other. And the fact that it refers to the other and not um, others, plural, suggests that this is a two-party agreement um, whereby- so counsel, what about the part that says that she, as the financially responsible party and her counsel, have read, understand, and agree to the scope and terms of the agreement? And should a dispute arise with respect to this agreement, it is agreed that the dispute shall be uh, resolved in accordance with the dispute resolutions pr provisions contained herein. Again, the arbitration part. And how, so how, how did she read that part? She, t this is not a, a easy agreement for a lay person to understand, we believe, to begin with. But all that provision does is say that you're agreeing to whatever the dispute resolution provision provided for. And if you look at that provision, it, all it refers to is uh, an agreement between an undefined term of the parties, and then it clarifies that the agreement is the exclusive remedy between two of those parties, the, the accountant and the lawyer. Well, counsel, why would you have to agree to that if it had nothing to do with you? That's what I think is my hard part about your argument, is that one, you are, you are squeezing this so hard to make it not make sense. So I don't know how how you can this this doesn't make sense because no one would require you to agree to something that has nothing to do with you. So as the financially responsible party, why would they ask her to agree to that if it had nothing to do with her? Yeah. So by sign, I will address that question. So by signing as financially responsible party, what she's saying is. Her lawyer is supposed to be retaining her accountant, supervising that accountant for purposes of this matrimonial case. She's the one who's signing as the one who's going to be responsible for the bills. And so if, in fact, there are bills um, that are relating to an arbitration, she understands she's responsible for that. No, no, that's not what that says. That's not what that says. That says that I understand that there, if there is a dispute about the bill, that that dispute is subject to the dispute resolution part of this agreement. That's the straight up thing that it says. And I don't know how you could squeeze it to mean something else. Well, we don't, we, we, we think that in light of the case law that says that an agreement to arbitrate has to be crystal clear, the fact that there isn't a defined uh, term of parties and that there are references to be, there being two parties um, to this agreement, um, just the counsel and the and the accountant, that there is at a minimum ambiguity around uh, whether she in fact understood that she was going to be arbitrating any disputes. But that, if you're not uh, a party, if you're not a party to the agreement, why are you signing it? Even if you're the financially responsible uh, in party, uh, why are you signing the agreement if you're not in a, a, a party to that agreement? If you're the, if, if, if it's purely because you're financially responsible, then sign a separate agreement talking about your responsibilities, your financial responsibilities. You can that, you can hold that question and ponder that. Um, who's representing um, Sapala and company? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court, David Mayer representing uh, the Cipolla and Company respondent. Uh, Your Honors, this, this case involves or arises out of a, a divorce case involving a marital estate worth more than $240 million. 
This case that, that you're hearing right now involves the dispute that Ms. Traffile has with her forensic accountants. In a few minutes, you're going to hear the companion case, which is her dispute with her attorneys. Yeah, well aware, counsel, if you could get to the meat of the uh, issues presented. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Turning first of all to the agreement to, the, to arbitrate, um, I think as uh, Justice Scarpoa has already pointed out, there, there was on the signature page, there was a very, very clear provision where Ms. Traffile as the financially signed as the financially responsible party. She signed directly beneath a provision that said, uh, should a dispute arise with respect to this agreement, it is agreed that such dispute shall be resolved in accordance with the dispute resolution provision contained herein. It goes on to say that, that any remedies in any other venue are waived. If we turn to the dispute resolution provision itself, which is uh, in the record on page 73, the dispute resolution uh, in paragraph four says, if a dispute or claim arises out of or relates to the engagement described herein, counsel and the parties, the parties plural, agree to settle such dispute or claim by arbitration administered through the, the AAA. So your um, adversary contends that the parties, that term, the parties is ambiguous in that she would not know that she was a party. Well, Justice Weber, I think that, that that just ignores the fact that at least three people, at least three entities or parties are talked about in that in that sentence. It says counsel, who's one, and the parties, which mean at least two other parties in addition to counsel, and there are three parties to this agreement. So by saying counsel and the parties, plural, it necessarily must include all three parties to the agreement. Uh, what, what my uh, opponent would like to do is simply eradicate that sentence from, from the agreement. He goes on to the next sentence, uh, which provides assurance to Ms. Traffile that her lawyer and her accountant will abide by the arbitration provision. But it doesn't undo the first sentence, which clearly says it, it's just unambiguous, as the, as the trial court below found, that counsel and the parties, the other two parties, plural, to the agreement, agree that all disputes arising out of this will be, will be arbitrated. So we, we just don't really understand how that sentence can be ignored and excised from the agreement uh, when that is the operative sentence. That is the sentence that, that has a commitment by all three parties to arbitrate under this, under this agreement. Moving on to the, the uh, other basis on which Ms. Traffile seeks to avoid or, or overturn the arbitration clauses, uh, and, and the arbitration clauses are the same in both of these engagement agreements. So the, the initially, the first engagement agreement is signed, um, and then later in the engagement, there is a revised engagement agreement. But the, the duty to arbitrate, the obligation to arbitrate before the, the AAA, uh, which is going on now, we've had already had 10 days of, of hearing, almost a, a year of proceedings. Um, that obligation is the same under both of the agreements. So on the un on the unconscionability argument, uh, Your Honors, um, Ms. Traffle has to prove both procedural and substantive unconscionability. And, and she has to treat the arbitration provision as a separate agreement from the rest of the engagement agreement. So if she's unhappy with the interest rate or she's unhappy with the security that she had to provide in the second uh, engagement agreement, not, none of that matters to the unconscionability argument. And was the, she not arguing that she was, to some extent, she was forced to sign the second one? Well, she, she does argue that, uh, uh, Justice Weber, but uh, the facts in the record are really you know, clear and uncontroverted. If we, if we first of all look at the initial engagement agreement, um, this was signed by her after an extensive uh, uh, set of meetings and discussions and emails led by her father, Mr. Schmidt, who is a financially sophisticated businessman, is a, a senior vice president at a real estate capital firm. He flew to, to, from Ohio to New York. He had a meeting with, with the Cipolla firm, Mr. Cipolla, and the Buchanan firm, Mr. Slotnick. 
Um, after that, Mr. Slotnick emailed not to Ms. Traffley, but to her father, Mr. Schmidt, because he was taking the lead in these negotiations, um, emailed the Cipolla engagement agreement uh, two days later to, to Mr. Schmidt. Two days after that, Mr. Schmidt wrote uh, to Slotnick and Cipolla and said, thanks to both of you for your initial thoughts related to an expedited plan of action and for forensic accounting priorities. Lara is ready, Lara, Ms. Traffoy, is ready to move forward. She and we, she slash we have a number of additional questions and comments. Um, she'll call in the morning to arrange a time for a conference call. So he's intimately involved. We very much appreciate your enthusiastic and sincere interest. This is not the discussion of somebody who is feeling bullied or trapped or intimidated. Um, and, and then it, it goes on. And uh, after there's another meeting and Ms. Traffley ultimately signs the agreement. She had one more question. That question was answered. She signs the agreement. Her father, Mr. Schmidt on November 25th, emails back and says, we are delighted, relieved, gratified, and excited to have you and Joe Sapola leading Lara's efforts going forward. Wednesday's meeting signing the agreements was a very significant overdue event and provided an extra very important milestone to celebrate on Thanksgiving Day. So the contemporaneous documentation shows that there's, there's no meaningful, no lack of meaningful choice, which she has to show. Uh, there's no high pressure tactics being used. There's a very sophisticated businessman who her father, who's intimately involved in the case, helps her negotiate this agreement. Um, and and it, it, it just it, there just is no unconscionability with respect to the first engagement agreement. And once you once you have that first engagement agreement, even if you were to throw out the second one, uh, the second arbitration clause, the, the first arbitration clause would come back into being, and that and that is um, also calls for arbitration at the at the AAA. The second um, uh, proceeding, the second agreement, uh, also had a lengthy. Um, set, we, we, we outlined this very, very clearly in the brief. There's a lengthy set of discussions. Again, her father is involved. Her father outlined a new aggressive, even more aggressive strategy that he wants to, to pursue. There's emails from Mr. Sapola saying, you know, if, if you want, if, you know, we already have $2.8 million of services that you've, you've asked for and we've performed. If you now want a, up to another $2 million of services, and this is in the email from Mr. Sapola to Ms. Traffley and Mr. Schmidt, then we need some additional security. And that really was the genesis for the second engagement agreement. Um, and, and so that there, there's no procedural unconscionability. There's no lack of choice. Uh, she, she had a first set of lawyers. She didn't like them. She came, you know, she fired her first lawyers and her first forensic accountant. She hired Buchanan, the Buchanan firm, and the Cipolla firm. She got to a point where she didn't want them anymore, and she went out and she got a new lawyer and a new forensic accountant. So the idea, which is which is crucial, by the way, to to this to to this procedural unconscionability, the idea that she had no meaningful choice, um, is is just not true. Thank As you, to, thank you. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honors. I'll brief, briefly um, address the clarity of the agreement and then turn to the unconscionability point. Um, the fact that there is a sentence right after uh, the provision that says that the parties agree to this remedy that says that only counsel and the client agree to that remedy is totally inconsistent, we believe, with the prior sentence. And um, it cannot be explained by the fact that three parties were um, agreeing to arbitrate their disputes. And that is why we believe that there is an ambiguity and an inconsistency around uh, whether there was an agreement to arbitrate, which ought to be crystal clear, and particularly in this context where we have a matrimonial client and we have, um, turning to the procedural arguments, a client who is supposed to be advised by counsel who was looking out for her interests, but in fact, it was a counsel who was looking out for the accountant's interest instead of her own. And uh, the unconscionability the, argument? Yeah. So on, on procedural point, th there is no evidence in the record that her counsel, Mr. Slotnick, 
had reviewed or um, gave any input whatsoever into the initial retainer letter um, before he signed it and before she signed it. Nor is there any evidence in the record that her father, who's not a lawyer, he's an elderly gentleman from Ohio, um, reviewed or gave any feedback on the retainer letter. Uh, nor is there any evidence in the record that the father's uh, personal lawyer, who's a friend of the family, ever saw, ever analyzed, ever commented upon either uh, retainer letter. And the allegations that addressed the supposed involvement of these individuals were disputed by Ms. Traffelay in a reply affirmation. And if in fact um, there had been a hearing as we contend there should have been, she would have been able to have an opportunity to correct some of the incorrect factual conclusions that underpin the lower court's decision, including so, that- Counselor, I'm sorry, what about the, the emails or letters that um, your adversary just read into the record concerning her father's uh, thanking, um, uh, thanking them for their assistance, stating that they had additional questions, stating that Laura was uh, pleased with the result? What about that? What about yes. those letters and emails? So those are, um, complimentary and encouraging emails. They have nothing to do with whether she understood the terms of the engagement letter that she was being put into, which were clearly against her interests in virtually um, every important respect insofar as they obligated her to have responsibility for bills that she could not pay. They knew she could not pay. They were immediately due. If she did not put in written objections within seven days, um, those objections under the agreement would be forever waived and interest would accrue on unpaid balances after 30 days, again, in a circumstance where everyone knew she couldn't pay them at rates as high as 18% above the usury rate in New York. So these are um, clearly unconscionable, we say, provisions, some of which violate the Part 1400 rules that um, protect matrimonial clients. And to the extent they want to rely on these two non-parties, uh, her father and um, her father's friend slash lawyer, there ought to be evidence in the record that they had substantive involvement in the process by which the retainer letter was entered into, reviewed, and negotiated. And there is no evidence in the record whatsoever that they had any involvement in that process. No, no, um, but counsel, this is Judge Scarpola. Didn't she represent in the agreement that she had the right to get a lawyer, that she had the right to have someone look at the agreement, and she understood that she had the right to do that? I mean, how much more do you want them to do? There, if, if she, she agreed to the provisions, she said she understood what the provisions are. There's no indication here that she didn't, except for you saying that. She signed a document saying that she, she did. She understood that she could get a lawyer to do it, that this was the agreement. I mean, I don't know how much more you could have expected. Well, she's, in the agreement, it says that the parties acknowledge that they have a right to counsel. So she signed she thought, that document, did she not? We don't dispute that she signed that document. She signed but we, a document that said, I understand that I have a right to a lawyer to look at this. I understand the provisions of this document. She signed a document that said that, correct? Yes, but she okay. signed it as the person who is financially responsible, not as the person to whom the letter was addressed. And she thought that Mr. Slotnick of Buchanan Ingersoll was her counsel, and she thought that he was looking out for her. And so in that sense, it was actually almost worse because she had um, the false sense of security that this agreement was going to protect her when, in fact, he wasn't protecting her. And that's, you know, the record uh, is, is what the record will reflect on this side. Now let's move on to the next appeal. And uh, what is the issue in this one, counsel? Okay, so the issue in the next appeal is whether it was proper for the lower court to fix the amount due by my client to her matrimonial lawyers on an account stated theory where there would be no assessment whether those fees were reasonable or whether they were appropriate in circumstances where she had raised a series of objections to the propriety of the invoices, the first of which was raised within a month of the date of the last invoice, 
where she had accused the lawyers of malpractice in three separate documents that had been filed well before the lower court had made a ruling on the charging lien application and where the invoices themselves evidence improprieties that are undeniable, including that they violated the rules applicable to matrimonial lawyers and they violated the party's engagement agreement. So if we go back to first principles, an account stated requires the delivery of regular invoices and then a lack of timely objection to hear to those invoices. Counsel, didn't doesn't the record reflect that uh, that uh, uh, your client endorsed the billable hours and and the time spent um, in in supporting the application for interim counsel fees, which was successfully granted, successfully granted, I think something along the lines of three point five million dollars. Yeah. So their argument is that um, she did endorse what they call the reasonableness of their work um, in connection with the fee application. But in fact, the record does not show that she submitted two affidavits in connection with these fee applications neither of which says anything about the reasonableness of Buchanan and Ingersoll's fees. They don't Didn't refer to the amount. Did you find uh, in a previous appeal that uh, the award of $3.5 million was not excessive or duplicative given the uh, complexity of the financial issues and that the family was generally satisfied with the rep representation? She and her father were generally satisfied? Um, so uh, what this court found uh, has to be put in proper context. These uh, fee applications were made as part of interim fee um, requests uh, during the divorce proceedings. The husband in that case had objected to the reasonableness of those fees and the trial co court, Justice Nervo at the time, had deferred, explicitly deferred ruling on the objections to the reasonableness of those fees saying, we're gonna take those up at trial. For now, we just need to level the playing field and, and the wife needs a certain amount of money to pay her counsel. And so it was in that context that this court said, on this record, we find the fees to be reasonable. But it, it is important to keep in mind that there had been no assessment about the reasonableness of those fees and any determination was explicitly going to be deferred to trial. And as I was um, saying earlier, the affidavits that my client submitted in those fee applications don't talk about any particular invoice, don't talk about the amounts. All they say is that her ex-husband controlled all of the money and that she had no ability to defend herself without um, access to funds and that she had been forced to draw down on retirement funds and take uh, loans from her parents in order to keep afloat. So all she was doing was asking the court to level the playing field by giving her access to funds. She said nothing about the reasonableness of those uh, fees. Well, and so- Judge Scarpula, did she object to any of the fees that you sought counsel fees for in that first fee application? She did not object. The husband objected at that time. I but she um, did. She made she no did not object. And that, did you raise the issue of the hourly rate in front of the trial court? Um, the issue of the hourly rate was not raised before the trial court, but it is apparent from the record because you can tell that the fees that they disclosed uh, in connection with these fee applications are not the fees that uh, were um, being charged to her at the time. And it's clear both under the matrimonial rules as well as the retainer letter that they had no right to raise fees without uh, disclosure and um, an agreement by her to agree to those fees, neither of which was obtained. Um, so um, returning to uh, the objections issue, uh, we don't think the law is that a client should be expected to object to counsel's fees uh, at a time when they are completely reliant on that counsel. And those that counsel is the only person giving her advice about whether what they're doing is appropriate or not. You say you don't think, what, uh, what, what is that based on? Uh, that's based on the um, Campagnola versus Mulholland Court of Appeals case. Uh, the site is 76 New York, um, uh, sorry, uh, this is a department case. 76 New York State sub second 38 um, recognizing that the attorneys should not benefit from the fact that a client belatedly learned of their misconduct 
and then sued for recovery, alleging so that's our practice. Not what, that's not what you're arguing here. You just said that because the client is being represented and therefore somehow dependent upon the attorney, they should not be expected to object to the fees which are being um, billed. That's something totally different. I don't, I don't see how a client could be expected to understand um, that their counsel is committing malpractice or billing excessively while they're being represented by that counsel. And in the circumstances- If I receive a bill for $2,000 for one minute of, of for one phone call or something of that nature, why would I not as the client object to that $2,000 or what, why would I not at least um, complain about it or question that billing. If you knew enough to complain, sure. But our our point here is this is a this is a person who had never hired an attorney or an accountant prior to her uh, divorce case, and she, knows she what has cost counsel. Come on, she knows what something costs. You know. Well of course she knows what things cost, but but if the counsel is telling her it is necessary for to, for her to do a certain amount of work and- But we that didn't even get to that point because she didn't even object to it. So you're making the argument that if, you know, but if counsel is telling her X, Y, and Z, she never even questioned it for there to be a uh, uh, an argument that counsel was in fact telling her something that was false. Well, you have to keep in mind that these invoices did not disclose any of the timekeeper rates. All they show is uh, a, a lump sum bill at the bottom, again, in violation of the retainer and the part 1400 rules. How is she suppo supposed to figure out who is charging her and, and their level of seniority when there are up to 17 timekeepers on these invoices and all she sees is one big number at the bottom? And I think point. there has to be some, some threshold of common sense in all of these arguments. It has to be that threshold of common sense. I recognize that she's a lay person. She may not be familiar with uh, legal billing, et cetera, but there is some degree of just a modicum of common sense. Um, you have rebuttal time. Sure. Good afternoon, Mayor, Stephen. You, uh, who's, not, who's representing? Sorry, this is Stephen Riccadulli for from Buchanan Ingersoll. May it please Thank the court. You. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, your, your Honor asked a question here before as to whether or not these objections were raised at the trial court level. And the record here is clear that there was never an objection made by Ms. Trafalet to Buchanan Ingersoll at any point in time during the representation. Um, in fact, there was never a, um, the, the, the only objection that, that plaintiff now looks to cite to is a complaint for malpractice, which was filed 18 months after the engagement um, ended in Counselor, June of 2019. Excuse me. Uh, this is Judge Mazzarelli. Counsel's more or less arguing that uh, the client here is in a situation somewhat like a patient with a doctor, that they're under the care and custody, and more, so to speak, of the uh, lawyer, and they're not in a position to object to the cost or the uh, type of, of representation. Uh, they're sort of under their spell, so to speak. Uh, sure. No, I, I appreciate that, Your Honor. Um, two points on, on that. One, you know, and counsel said this was not the first time she had, had, a, had hired a law firm. In fact, by the time she had engaged Buchanan, this had been the third law firm that she had hired in connection with her divorce and was already in fee disputes with the prior two at the time she, re she uh, engaged Buchanan Ingersoll. So she currently... She clearly appreciated um, the need to pay her counsel in connection with with the divorce proceedings. Two, you know, the law in New York makes clear that that if there's going to be an objection, that it needs to be timely. What they're asking for is a blanket um, a blanket provision here, where any party to a divorce proceeding can wait, rack up huge legal bills, and then at the end of it, you know, then then seek to challenge invoices all while asking the counsel to work for free. And, and the law makes clear here that if, if there is going to be an objection to the bills, that they need to be timely and specific. And here, this issue about you know whether or not there were um, specific rates identified or specific timekeepers identified, those types of objections or complaints about a bill are easily identifiable on the face of it. This is not a matter of where she's arguing 
um, that she didn't appreciate the nature of the work or the scope of the work. Here she's arguing, you know, there, there seems to be timekeeper rates missing from certain of the bills, um, which are easily identifiable and frankly can be done by a layperson. R- well, related to- saying, I, I thought the argument was that the statement was that she would just receive an invoice with just a dollar amount at the bottom with no uh, indication as to exactly what the uh, amount was for. Your Honor, that, that, that's just simply not true. What what counsel is suggesting here is, and there are bills in the record, and I can say the one starts at record site 207. There's an invoice from Buchanan Ingersoll from February two, uh, 2017. What it identifies is the date worked, the name of the timekeeper, the number of hours worked, and then a, a narrative of the time that was worked during that time period. What's missing from at least some of these invoices is the is the time is the billable rate for that timekeeper um but at the bottom of the bill if you'll allow me to scroll to it i apologize here it is it does give a total of amount work but these are not just a for example a summary a summary bill that says for you know services rendered in the month of february and then a lump sum i mean this is an itemized bill that identifies the total hours worked and then the total fees charged for the time period. Um, the one piece missing, of course, from at least the bill I'm looking at, is the um, is the specific rate charged by the individual timekeepers. But these these are not just a you know a lump sum summary bill for the amounts charged during a specific time period. So the the other point is, and I know Council said that the 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 applications or the fee applications and the affidavits she signed in, in uh, support of the fee applications. Um, you know, the, the issue here is whether or not she had knowledge of the defects or whether or not she had knowledge of the billing rates. We believe she raised those objections. The fee applications identified the billing rates of the timekeepers. Um, she clearly signed those. So a- any, any defect in the bills or technical defect in the bills were clearly waived when she signed these. Um, but more importantly, the issues she's raising now for the first time on appeal had these issues been presented to the trial court, we obviously would have had the opportunity then to counter these arguments with record evidence or submit additional evidence. And it's inappropriate for her to raise them for the first time on appeal before this court. Thank you very much, Counselor. Thank you. You have um, one minute in rebuttal. Thank you. Um, when it comes to the invoices themselves, these are not um, defects that can be remedied. There's a rule that applies to matrimonial lawyers that says you have to disclose the timekeeper rates in your engagement letter, and and they're not disclosed there. There's just an undifferentiated range from 200 some odd to a thousand some odd dollars an hour for all timekeepers, and likewise the bills um, do not disclose the rates of any individual timekeeper. There might be some world in response to Justice Weber's point where if you saw one minute of time billed in 2,000 hours, that even a lay person, uh, $2,000 I should say, where even a lay person could figure that out. But that's not the circumstance that we find ourselves in here where there is a lot of time being spent and she's expected to figure out whether she's being overcharged. And she cannot figure that out, we submit, on her own. And when she gets new counsel, and within a month of the last invoice, new counsel is raising objections about those invoices. Um, Those objections are reiterated in a letter in March of 2018, on which Mr. Slotnick is copied, accusing them of malpractice and and failing to supervise the accountant. They're also raised uh, malpractice objections in opposition to the charging lien application, and finally in the malpractice complaint that we filed. That's four separate examples starting within 30 days of the date of the last invoice. Um, Those are reasonable time periods uh, under the case law that we cite in our brief. And we think it was error for the lower court to find that there was no way to that there was no way to conclude that there was potentially a factual issue about the reasonableness and timeliness of those objections under the circumstances. Thank you very much, Counselor. Have a good day. Thank you. The next matter up is uh, Mobley versus New York City Transit. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Harriet Wong on behalf of Defendant's Appellants. Objective video can tell an accurate story that words can never truly convey. Here, the objective video established that the motion of the bus was neither sudden, unusual, nor violent. 
Rather, the video established that the plaintiff, who was already rocking and swaying in his seat prior to the incident, was the only passenger to fall out of his seat at the moment of the incident. In fact, the passenger sitting directly across the aisle from the plaintiff was not caused to move at all because of this incident. Further, passengers who were sitting at the front of the bus were not caused to fall out of their seats. They were merely caused to sway ever so slightly in their seats at the moment of the incident. Lastly, the motion of the bus was not violent, sudden, or unusual because the speed of the bus over a period of four to five seconds was merely reduced from 16 miles per hour to eight miles per hour, a speed at which this court has held on prior occasions is not considered to be a violent or unusual motion. This court in Patterson versus New York City Transit Authority held that a speed reduction from five miles per hour to zero miles per hour was not considered violent, unusual, nor sudden. Similarly, this case in Flessinger versus MTA held that a reduction of speed from seven miles per hour to zero miles per hour, causing a passenger to fall from her fall onto the bus was not considered anything more than a typical jolt or jerk on a bus that's experienced in common city bus travel. What about but, the emergency document uh, uh, doctrine? Yes, Your Honor, I was just about to go there. Um, and even if we take away all of these facts, the video also establishes that the emergency doctrine applies to this case to dismiss the complaint. The bus operator was confronted with a situation where a pedestrian wearing red pants, as can be seen in the video, walked suddenly outside of the crosswalk from the middle of the block directly from adjacent to a building in a beeline towards the curb of the street, walked off of the sidewalk and into the street just as the bus was merging into the right lane to pull into a bus stop at 17 miles per hour. The bus operator, when confronted with this unusual circumstance, reasonably reduced his speed, veered back towards the left a little to straighten out the bus and honked his horn at this pedestrian, signifying that the bus is approaching. Well, These Supreme, were Court, Supreme Court found that this was not, that they created an issue of fact because the uh, pedestrian took one step, I think, off the curb and was raising their hand. And, and so there was an issue as to whether or not there was, whether or not the emergency uh, doctrine really was called into play. Well, as can be seen in the video, the pedestrian did not just take one step. Over a span of about three seconds, the pedestrian went from leaning against the side of a building, walking in a beeline straight off of the sidewalk into the street. And at the moment the incident was occurring, the bus operator is not is not expected to anticipate what that person is going to do. And it is much more reasonable to take prudent actions to avoid this pedestrian than to proceed in the course that the bus was going, which was to merge into the right lane. This court held so in Seiko versus City of New York, where the bus, uh, where the motor vehicle operator was operating at 10 miles per hour and was driving and saw two uh, children playing on the sidewalk and reduce their speed from 10 miles per hour. And this court held that was prudent action in anticipation that those children would step off onto the street. Here, the pedestrian was in the course of stepping off onto the street when the bus operator commenced these prudent actions. But even if we take away the emergency doctrine, the video clearly establishes that the motion of the bus was not extraordinary or violent because plaintiff is the only passenger to fall out of his seat. The passenger sitting directly across the aisle from the plaintiff wasn't caused to move at all. Actually, that pedestrian, that passenger was only caused to move after the plaintiff fell to his feet when he leaned forward to look at the plaintiff. So based on those facts, if this court does not deem the emergency doctrine to apply, then the motion of the bus was not extraordinary or violent and no different than the typical jerks and jolts of the common city bus travel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court. Your Honors, uh, based on the evidence that was presented in this case, uh, the, the movements simply haven't established their rights to summary judgment. There was no emergency to begin with, uh, with respect to, to the actions that were taken by this bus driver. And the bus operator, as well as the New York City Transit Authority, has pro provided multiple different accounts as to what actually occurred on the day of this incident. Uh, there were statements by the bus driver that an individual darted across in front of the bus. 
a, a review of the video shows that there was no such event. In fact, the gentleman in question walked along the sidewalk at a bus stop and raised his hand to summons the bus. And as the lower court found, he took one step off the curb to alert the driver, one step. This beeline issue is only created by the council in trying to get summary judgment in this matter. They have provided no evidence to substantiate their claim that this was an unusual, unusual, not an unusual or violent movement of the bus other than the council's own testimony. The fact here that the client in this case, Mr. Mobley, was tossed out of his seat and sustained an injury sufficient that he warranted a fusion uh, with respect to the injury that occurred justifies the, the underlying move, uh, sufficient drastic movement of the bus here. So based upon our case law, uh, is, it not, is it relevant that he is the only individual who was propelled out of their seat that none of the other passengers on the bus are propelled out of their seats. He's the only one. Ms. Mr. Mobley was the only one, unfortunately, that, that was sleeping on the bus at the time. On all the other passengers, um, if you look at the video, they jerk and they had enough time to hold on or brace themselves because you're alert and your body, you're able to control the movement of your body because you're alert at the time. He was not alert because he was sleeping at the time and was tossed from his seat out of the bus and the lower court. So review. now we have another category. We have to add sleeping passenger to uh, to the category of passengers on the bus. Well, Your Honor, the issue here is not sleeping passenger. The, the issue here is whether or not the bus moved in such a violent nature that it caused the passenger to be tossed from his seat. And the transit authority in their argument is trying to have both the front and the back of the argument saying there's an emergency. We had to take severe action with respect to their attempt to get the emergency doctrine. And on the other hand saying, well, there wasn't an emergency. The bus didn't have to swerve such such a violent nature. So how do we reconcile this case with our, with the, this court's recent decision in Castilla? Well, Your Honor, the issue is with respect to the, the their attempt to get the emergency doctrine, the, the, all the courts have said that this issue must go before a jury to make the determination as to whether or not the movement of the bus was so sudden and so drastic. And in terms of um, the distance that the, the plaintiff fell from his seat onto the the bus floor would be a determination uh, that would fall under the court's de decision. Well, we also looked at, again, whether others on the bus were also propelled from their seats. I, I think- Again, we're back to the situation where uh, Mr. Mobley is the only one who is propelled uh, from his seat, or who falls. Who falls? And so in this case, we would have to look at whether or not the, the passenger was alert and had the opportunity to to brace himself. In other words, to prevent himself from being tossed, uh, as compared to the other passengers who were awake. And I and I would have to agree with your honor that yes, your honor, we we would need to have to substantiate or create a class for passengers who were, who were not aware of the actions. That are, and occur. I guess you would need some type of expert testimony that because you are asleep, that that would and there's a sudden motion that would cause a sleeping person to be propelled more so than a person who is not asleep. I believe, I would, I would believe that would be for the trial courts, Your Honor. Are there, are there Any no questions? Any questions? No. Your Honors, if I may just correct a misstatement of fact, the plaintiff was not. I don't asleep. believe you had any rebuttal, uh, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next matter is Ellington Owners versus uh, 200 Broadhurst. Yes, good afternoon, Your Honors. Brian Battisti representing West Manor in the Bluestone organization. Uh, there are two appeals. If Your Honor pleases, I, I can address both in my argument, or I can have four minutes and one for rebuttal. If you could address both, I'd appreciate it. Okay. All right, Your Honor, as pled, this is a construction defect claim. The underlying court should have dismissed all claims. It dismissed the breach of contract claim. Uh, the plaintiff also alleges two neg negligence claims. These are both duplicative of the breach of contract claim. This was not disputed by the plaintiff or the respondent in the underlying motion. Uh, step further, the negligence causes of action should have been dismissed for the statute of limitations. These are causes of actions by an owner of the building against the contractor. Uh, they stem in construction defect and therefore they accrue at the time of completion, which was over eight years before the 
uh, claim was brought. With regards to the dismissal of the Bluestone organization, uh, the lower court got the decision correct when it stated that the complaint does not particularize facts uh, in order to uh, pierce the corporate bail. So unless you know you have our briefs, you have our facts, I'm happy to answer any uh, questions. I want to ask you, when do you think the statute of limitations began to run against the unit owners? Against the unit owner, the residential unit owner? Yeah. For a contractor, it began to accrue at the completion. Were they parties to that contract? As pled? Yes, they plead that they are. Uh, no, no, no. I'm asking you, assuming that they weren't, they weren't because those claims were dismissed because they weren't parties to the contract. So why, what claim, why, why should they, why should that claim accrue against them at the time of construction? Because they are the owner of the property and in the breach of contract was not dismissed because of uh that there wasn't a contract. It was dismissed on statute of limitations. All right, the, okay. the court, I'm right. So you're court. saying the owners, the, not the sponsor, the owners had individual construction contracts with the construction manager? As pled, they claim that they are beneficiaries of the contract. I'm not, I'm asking you whether or not, not as pled, I'm asking you, they said they're beneficiaries of the contract. Right. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you whether they are signatories to that contract. They are not signatories to that contract. No. And do they have any ability uh, separately to um, supervise the work of the contractors? The individual unit owners? No. Yes. No. no. So they had no ability to do to at the time that the construction manager was working to affect anything about the construction, right? They're, they bought their apartments later. Right. And your claim is on that, that they should still be held. The claim should have arose when the construction contract was completed. Not my claim. The law is clear because they're the resident. <laughs> you know. I, I, in fact, I think the law is exactly the opposite to that. That's why I'm asking you about this. Not as the owner. Uh, the case is cited by the underlying uh, court as well as the board in their briefs, those are related to adjacent property. So the well, they're related to property that the that the person who, who is not a member of the construction contract and doesn't have any ability to get a warranty or all the other things you do to protect yourself. Right. Right. That's what that that it doesn't matter that you're the next door neighbor or two neighbors down. What matters is whether you have the ability to protect yourself either through contract or warranty or something else. Here, the unit owners don't have that ability because they weren't a party to the contract. They didn't have any ability. There's no functional equivalency of privity. They're not controlling the way the construction gets done. They're not able to inspect the construction. They bought their, their, their units later, right? Could have, they bought their units later, yes, but the law is clear that it comes on completion. Otherwise, what you're doing is opening up contractors to unlimited uh, liability, which you essentially have will have the owner of any property can sue the contractor 10, 20, 15 years down the line. Right? We see this in the, the Sutton case that they put. So the resident, because they are the owner as compared to uh, an adjacent property. So you're saying that because you're the owner, the, the, the onus should be on you, the subsequent purchaser of the property, rather than the person who actually does the bad work. That's Please your start. argument? That the person who has no ability to protect themselves in terms of warranty or contractual liability or anything else, they should get all the risk. And the party who is alleged, who I have no idea whether or not this is true or not, who did shoddy work should just not have any of the risk because uh, because they're not they're not next door neighbors. No, they they're. I mean, well, we're going to getting into a theoretical. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Your Honor. 
I thought you said the law only protects next door neighbors. The law, well, there's a statute of limitations, right? Right. The law is clear that an, an owner, right, no matter how you functionally, it could, it's the city of Newburgh case, right? And it says- I know the cases, yeah, we both know. So, but you're saying to me that's limited only to the next door neighbor. I'm saying that the case is cited by the underlying court, right, as well as the Gordon case, which that is related to uh, property that was not damaged by the owner, right? So construction defect is different from property damage. So construction defect is actual fixing the defects in the construction, right? So, oh, you, you got to fix the roof or something like that as compared to property damage, where in the Gordon case, the slab as your honor well knows, the slab fell and damaged the unit owner, right? I like, guess I do. I yes, do know. But I think I'm, not, right. I'm not right? willing to distinguish it the way that you are. I don't think the fact that it was the next door neighbor, it was the linchpin. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. May it please the court. Uh, Alexander Lickianis of Rosenberg and Estes for the uh, respondent appellant. And again, I'd like to address both of the appeals. Uh, I, I'll address my appeal first because it wasn't addressed by uh, my colleague. Um, the um, Supreme Court uh, was precipitous in uh, dismissing our claim for piercing the corporate veil. Um, if uh, the court looks at our amended complaint in the record, um, we allege, among other things, that the West Manor Construction Corp and its uh, parent company, the Pluson Organization, shared the same office, shared the same telephone number, shared the same principals, officers, directors, and employees. And in fact, if you look at the Bluestone Organization's website, even though West Manor Construction Corp uh, was, the, was the contracting party who was- Counselor, the this is Judge Mazzarelli, hello. Uh, did you uh, allege that the uh, corporate form was used to injure the plaintiffs? That's yes, a necessary we, part of, of uh, alter ego. Yes, we, we did do that. We did, Your Honor. Um, How? I believe it was. I believe um, it, it was in uh, it was in our ninth and tenth causes of action, Your Honor. We did specifically uh, allege that um, the the corporate form was used to commit a wrong against uh, our client against. Um, uh, against our client uh, in that the uh, the building was defectively constructed and that we were made to suffer uh, property damage. Um, the uh, in the in the Shizgal case, uh, this court put forth a number of factors that courts have to look at uh, in determining whether or not to pierce the corporate veil. And three of those factors are overlap in owners, officers, directors, and personnel, common office space, address, and telephone numbers and whether the corporation in question had property that was used by other of the corporations as if it were its own. And right now at this, at the pleading stage before any discovery has been done and based solely on what's in the public record and, and what we know within our limited knowledge, we set forth sufficient allegations that we should be able to move forward to discovery. Now, of course, it's my, gonna be my burden to prove that it, and you know, I fully take that on, but we believe that uh, Supreme Court was uh, precipitous in not letting us get to that um, uh, uh, stage. And in fact, if if the court looks at the Gutierrez case that it decided earlier this year, which was again on summary judgment, not even a motion to dismiss, so it was a more difficult standard for the plaintiff, uh, this court held there that summary judgment was properly denied where the evidence showed that the subject companies were interchangeable as there existed overlap in ownership, as well as common use of office space, equipment, and employees. And we've we've established that, we're, we, we've alleged it now based on evidence that's in the public record, and we're only at the, at the pleading stage. So we believe that we should be permitted to move forward on those claims and get discovery. Um, I'm sorry, counsel, can you repeat to, for me, what was the wrong you think that the defendant used the corporation to do? What was the wrong? The wrong was the defective construction of the of the building. Wait, and but, but the, the subsidiary they, did that, right? You're, the question is, how did the, the corporate parent use the subsidiary to do that wrong? Well, well, again, that's that's, that's a general claim, right? It has to have to actually use it to do. 
so that's right. what I'm asking. What's the allegation? Okay. Well, again, the allegation is that um, that the uh, that the Bluestone organization utilized this subsidiary entity to um, to uh, to actually uh, perform the work, right? Because on its website, that's usually what a subsidiary does. Right. No, but no, but what's the wrong. That's what I'm trying to get at. No, no, I, I understand that. But if you look at the website, and we allege this in our amended complaint, Your Honor, Bluestone Organization actually alleges that they were the general contractor for the construction of this building. And when they constructed this building, it was defective, as we've outlined in detail in our complaint. So it's not just that there's a relate. Of course, there's going to be a relationship wherever you have a parent and a subsidiary. But when you look at everything together, when you look at the offices, the phone numbers, the employees, the officers, the directors, it's one in the same entity, Your Honor. And um, and so that so th that's the relationship. And it's not just your typical. It's that this West Manor entity was was a sim was simply non-existent. Um, as far as the other appeal, I see my time is running out. I think uh, Justice Scarpula, you you covered everything with the Gordon case, which I actually recall arguing before Your Honor at uh, at um, uh, at 80 Center Street. So uh, I believe my time is up. So unless there are any more questions about the appeal, I'll, I'll rest on my brief. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Batista, I'll give you two, two minutes in rebuttal. Two minutes in rebuttal. Do you need sure. rebuttal? Yes, we, as we will stand on our brief, as I said in my initial argument, that there's just not the particularized facts uh, with regards to the alter ego breaching. You know, they're just alleging that they're related companies. And if that was the standard, then every related company you could, uh, you know, counsel corporate. Would you please address the um, allegation that Bluestone says on its website that it performed the construction work at the subject premises? Bluestone has, so it's a banner of, of companies and on its website, it addresses projects that the banner of companies have been uh, involved with. So it doesn't, that's all it is. It's a more. So it does specifically state that they were the JC? The GC, excuse me. No, it's listed under projects. So it has projects that the companies have been involved in. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. People v. Tremaine Francis. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Honor. I'm Catherine Martone on behalf of Mr. Francis. If I could reserve one minute for rebuttal, I would appreciate it. Certainly. Um, I'd like to address our claim raised in point one of our brief that Mr. Francis was denied due process as a result of an unduly suggestive identification procedure. Um, on April 19, Detective Reed observed an unknown man for about 10 seconds while looking through his side view mirror at a group of four men who were moving a motorcycle six houses away. Then about 10 days later, Detective McGuire uh, showed Reed um, Mr. Francis's arrest photo and informed him that evidence connected um, Mr. Francis Ms. Martone, to uh the uh, this is Judge Mazzarelli. Hello. Uh, if if we were to accept that uh, argument, uh, why would the why would not the harmless error doctrine apply in this um, particular instance? Well, because this is constitutional error, the more lenient standard for harm analysis applies. This is a case where identification was the key is issue. And um, Mr. Uh, Francis did not make any statements. Um, and Detective Reed was the prosecution's only eyewitness. And the jury requested during deliberations a readback of his testimony. So under these circumstances, the error was most certainly um, harmful. It's preserved. Um, the district attorney um, does not argue to the contrary. And so if um, 
uh, this error requires reversal of the judgment and that the motion be granted and uh, a new trial ordered. Wasn't there a whole uh, parcel of other evidence that identified your client and placed him at the scene of the crime and uh, uh, as a participant in the theft of, of a van and a motorcycle? Yes. No, there was not, Judge. The, the evidence in this case was extremely thin. Um, as I said, Detective Reed was the prosecution's only eyewitness. And apart from that, there were um, cell phone records that um, purportedly established that a cell phone used in the commission of the crime belonged to Mr. Francis. Uh, first of all, the district attorney at pages 26 and 46 of his brief is overstating the nature of that evidence. For instance, the subscriber records are not in Mr. Francis's name and address. But putting that aside, uh, the more important point here is that regardless of who owned the cell phone, the prosecution had to prove that Mr. Francis was the person using it during the commission of the crimes. Detective Reed's tainted identification testimony and uh, was, you know, one major source of proof of that. And then the only other testimony as to identity, establishing that Mr. Francis was the person using the cell phone, was Detective McGuire's um, voice identification. Um, Detective McGuire conceitedly misidentified Mr. Francis in this case, leading to the dismissal of, you know, eight counts of the indictment. And he also conceitedly misidentified another man in this case. And yet he claimed that he could reliably identify Mr. Francis's voice by distinguishing between the hundreds of people on the thousands of intercepted calls in connection with this wiretap based on just four of those recordings that lasted just a few seconds each. And the important thing about the voice identification and why that evidence is completely unreliable is that Detective McGuire knew about the alleged connection to the cell phone and so that influenced his identification of appellant's voice, the knowledge of the, the connection to the number. And the other important point about that, Your Honor, is that- um, You can uh, address that on rebuttal, counsel. People. Okay. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. John Croix for the people. Uh, be so according to your adversary, there, there doesn't seem to have been any evidence uh, as to the defendant's complicity in, in this crime. The uh, photo ID was, was tainted. Um, uh, McGuire misidentified the defendant's voice. There was nothing uh, to connect the defendant to the cell phone other than that he was a subscriber. So what evidence uh, of guilt was there? Uh, there was extensive evidence of guilt, I think, starting first and foremost with the wiretap conversations, which recorded defendant uh, Selwyn Mills and the other two individuals involved stealing this motorcycle and van in real time. Now, we so know it was have an identification of his voice. Yes, uh, we do. And how is that? Um, how do we know that it, it is uh, that it can be trusted based upon is this McGuire's testimony as to the identification? Oh, it's a, it's a number of it's a number of different uh, pieces of evidence that were introduced to trial, Your Honor. Uh, it's that it was defendant's cell phone. It was that the defendant's uh, cell phone was recovered from him, so it was certainly defendant's cell phone. It's that the calls that were made uh, in the AM to Mills, where they discuss uh, getting this started, talking to Cadet, talking to Holland, those were made. We know from cell site data from defendant's home address. 
Uh, it is defendant's voice as well, which we have McGuire, uh, Detective McGuire, personally met with defendant for an extended period of time before making that voice ID for the purpose of hearing his voice. He then explained at trial to the jury pretty carefully what made defendant's voice unique. He was pretty specific too. He described, you know, how defendant has a very high nasally voice. He speaks very slowly. He sounds like he's half asleep. He has an unaccented voice, which distinguished him from a number of the other individuals. But he and misidentified him, but did he identify a voice as being that of the defendant when in actuality it was not? Yes, Your Honor. There was initial thought that defendant had been involved in some calls that the detectives, uh, and as they explained at trial, they're continuously doing reviews of the many hours of wiretaps they have, right? And a later review revealed uh, that McGuire did not believe the defendant was associated with those later calls, but those other calls were from a different number the defendant did not have in his name, and the voice didn't match up with the voice when McGuire had the opportunity to sit down with defendant in person. And now, Your Honors, on this point, and I think this is crucial, these calls were played for the jury after McGuire described exactly what he saw in defendant's voice that made him say, hey, that's defendant's voice. So the jury had the opportunity to match the description McGuire gave to the actual words the defendant was speaking. And that's on top of, of course, the cell site data that puts defendant's phone near all these crimes. And at the beginning of the day, puts that first call from defendant's phone to these people from defendant's house. So I think, Your Honors, we know that this is defendant who made those calls. And those calls, they detail very carefully, as we lay out in our brief, the entire you know series of events from them stealing the van, using the van to steal the bike, taking the bike to Marlboro Road. And Your Honors, that, that alone would be sufficient and overwhelming evidence of defendant's guilt here. Uh, as for Reed's identification, this was not a suggestive identification procedure. This is nothing like the cases the defendant cites. This is more akin to this court's decision in, in Acosta or, or the Gitmauer decision. Uh, this is a situation where you have two officers in a wire room. One of the officers holds up a picture to Detective Reed and says, do you recognize this guy? And Detective Reed immediately says, yes, I saw that guy a couple days ago on a surveillance. Now, Your Honor, my adversary said um, um, incorrectly, Justice Khan found explicitly that this wasn't the case. My adversary claimed that um, that uh, Reed had been primed in advance, that this was in, this was a, a, a uh, uh, April 19th related photograph. Uh, that, is, that is not the case. Uh, Justice Khan found explicitly that that was not what happened, that the information about the context for the photograph was only provided to Reed after he identified the man in it. I, I think this is very important, Your Honors, because in the single photograph ID cases, where there's an issue about showing somebody a photograph and suggesting to them that that is the person you know, who committed the crime, those are rarely cases where you have dozens and dozens of defendants, hundreds and hundreds of victims, and hundreds and hundreds of crimes. In this case, I think, again, it's more like the case in Acosta, where you have a large organization, you have a photograph of someone up on a wall in Acosta, here it was being held and shown, with no more information provided other than that there is this photograph. And under those circumstances, for an officer to say, I recognize that guy, he wasn't primed and he wasn't suggested in any way. I don't think this was a suggestive ID at all, Your Honors. Um, but as, as Justice Mazzarelli pointed out, I think even without the, the ID, I think without the Marlboro Road information, you still have the jury being able to hear every step of this crime in defendant's own voice. And as a result, even without that evidence, the evidence would have been overwhelming. Um, if Your Honors have any further questions, I'm happy to address them. Otherwise, we'll rest on our briefs. Any questions? Thank you very much, Counselor. Thank Martel. you. Yes, I just would like to um, point out that um, as to Detective McGuire's voice identification, the um, the recordings um, lasted 28 seconds, 39 seconds, 45 seconds, and 77 seconds. That's the duration of the recordings. Appellant's voice is only one of the two voices on those recordings that Detective McGuire is purportedly able to identify. And the jury did not have um, an exemplar of Appellant's voice to compare the recordings to. So the jury is left with only the opinion of Detective McGuire that appellant's voice matched those short seconds of a recording. We don't have to show to demonstrate harm uh, that uh, 
the there's no evidence. We, we simply have to show that the tainted evidence of Detective Reed's identification may have contributed to the jury's verdict. And as I say, given the thinness of the other identification evidence in this case, um, we've, we've certainly met that standard. Thank you very much. Next matter is CW Capital Cobalt versus CW Capital Investments. Your Honor, uh, Your Honor, Jonathan Pickart, uh, on behalf of the appellant, uh, CW Cobalt Capital uh, BR. Uh, Cobalt is a Cayman Islands investment fund that has brought claims against its registered investment advisor in certain of the advisor's affiliates for acts of self-dealing in connection with the management of Cobalt's portfolio of commercial mortgage-backed securities. I wish to address two clear errors in the motion court's ruling dismissing certain of Cobalt's breach of contract and breach of fiduciary duty claims under 3211A1 and 7. First and most importantly, the claims at issue should have been held timely under New York's continuing obligations doctrine. Cobalt's investment advisor had multiple ongoing obligations to manage Cobalt's portfolio in Cobalt's best interest. This included contractual duties under a collateral management agreement with up to a 25-year term that had commenced in 2007. It also included fiduciary duties owed by registered investment advisors under New York and federal law. Cobalt's complaint alleges repeated breaches of these duties by the respondents during the limitations period. For example, the complaint alleges that Cobalt's investment advisor exercising Cobalt's rights as Cobalt's agent, allowed one of the advisor's affiliates to keep hundreds of millions of dollars in excessive servicing fees that should rightly have been shared with Cobalt, including from the sales of uh, the Stytown development in 2015 and from the sale of a Las Vegas apartment complex in 2017. The complaint further alleges Cobalt's investment advisor, again, exercising Cobalt's rights as Cobalt's agent allowed another of the advisor's affiliates to collect kickbacks from service providers hired to execute sales of trust assets, including through the creation of an online auction website created in 2017. These claims are all timely because they allege breaches of ongoing duties in the years leading up to the filing of Cobalt's lawsuit, well within the limitations period. The motion court's ruling that these claims were untimely on the basis that there was a single solitary of breach that accrued before the limitations period is contrary to the continuing obligations doctrine under New York law. For example, in the court of appeals decision in Bulova, the court held that the fact a roofing supply company had started breaching its ongoing long-term obligation to maintain a roof 18 years before the plaintiff initiated suit did not preclude the plaintiff from seeking damages for each dereliction of duty that occurred within the six years prior to the suit being filed. And this court recently held in Yin Shin Lung Charitable Foundation that breaches by fiduciaries, as we have here, don't occur once upon the decision to engage in the breach, but rather upon each exercise of judgment and authority in violation of their ongoing obligations. That is precisely what has been alleged here. Repeated exercises of judgment by Cobalt's investment advisor to allow transactions it had the authority to stop through which its affiliates received excessive fees and kickbacks. Beyond violating precedent, however, it would also violate public policy to find Cobalt barred from enforcing the respondent's ongoing obligations under a 25-year contract simply because the breaching conduct began more than six years before Cobalt filed suit. The effect of that ruling would mean that a party to a long-term contract that was not sued within six years of its first breach would be allowed to continue breaching the contract with impunity in perpetuity. In this case, that would leave respondents free to continue breaching 
their ongoing obligations to Cobalt for the 15 years remaining on the collateral management agreement's term without Cobalt having any ability to enforce the advisor's obligations or seek redress for the advisor's ongoing breaches. That is neither New York law nor sound public policy, and Cobalt should be allowed to proceed on the basis of the breaches of contractual and fiduciary duties it is specifically alleged within Counsel. the limitation period. I, yes, I have a simple, very simple question. So as these breaches accumulated, um, did the did Cobalt just close its eyes and wish for it to go away or did it take action? Your Honor, uh, it did you know, take action shortly after Cobalt's directors became aware of this conduct. They were notified of the conduct in 2007. Uh, and at that point, they engaged counsel and they had initiated litigation claims after raising the conduct with the, its investment advisor by the end of the year. Uh, so nobody was sitting on their hands here uh, with, with, respect to this, with respect to this conduct. Uh, they acted quickly and responsibly. Uh, now, the other point that I wanted to raise was re with regard to the motion court's error uh, in dismissing counts on the basis of supposed documentary evidence conclusively demonstrating that Cobalt's fair value purchase option rights had been waived. The purported documentary evidence was not itself a waiver, but rather a single ambiguous sentence in an offering memorandum, not a contract, that referenced a waiver of unspecified purchase rights by a third party that sold Cobalt its portfolio. The document actually affecting the waiver itself was not before the court, and Cobalt has never seen it. We have never seen it making it impossible for us to test the substance of the single sentence that the court relied upon as supposed conclusive evidence. Moreover, Cobalt itself is not even mentioned in the sentence, leaving it ambiguous as to whether any of Cobalt's rights were impacted by the seller's waiver, and if so, which rights and how. For these reasons, this, this sentence, standing by itself, which the court relied upon, does not meet the standard for conclusive documentary evidence under 3211A1. And the claim should be reinstated so that discovery, including into any supposed waiver, and we can see the actual underlying document that supposedly constitutes the waiver, can be conducted. Uh, Your Honors, I see that I am over my six minutes, unless anybody has questions. Thank you. Your Honor, good afternoon. Greg Cross <clears throat> on behalf of the Appellees. Uh, I'm going to start with in response to the question that's posed. I mean, Cobalt did more than sit on its hands. For 10 years, Cobalt certified no default existed under the CDO. The prior administrators of the CDO reviewed financial statements that they received monthly, it's in the record and undisputed, from the CDO and reviewed financial statements with respect to all the actions that CW Capital was taking with respect to the pooling and servicing agreement monthly. And Cobalt always had, and still has to this day, the ability to fire CWCI as its collateral manager. Counsel, but it, could you yes. just slow down a little bit? Yes. Thank and, you. And it's, <laughs> I'm trying to cram it all into six minutes. So, and Cobalt always had and has to this day the ability pursuant to the collateral management agreement to terminate CWCI. This notion of helplessness that they have no remedy is simply not true. They've never exercised that remedy. This is actually an after the fact acquisition by parties who seized control of the issuer and now are trying to reach back with a gotcha claim to collect fees. Counsel was asked at the hearing, when did your claim accrue? He gave a definitive answer. Our claims first accrued when CWCI became aware that it should use its right to terminate COBE CW Capital as special servicer and negotiate a new fair sh fee share agreement. We know from the face of the complaint that that happened no later than August of 2011 beyond limitations. There are two, th two parts of that statement though that are crucial for the, to evaluate the continuing obligation doctrine. First, Cobalt identified its obligor as CWCI. There are two trusts in this case, and things get confused because they're mixed and matched. But this action grows out of a Cayman Island CDO and breach of a collateral, alleged breach of a collateral management agreement by CWCI. 
The actions that are complained of are not by CWCI, but by CW Capital Asset Management, which is the special servicer for various pooling and servicing agreements that, that administer CMBS bonds. CW Capital is not a party to the CDO documents, and neither of the CDO doc parties are parties to the, to the CMBS documents. What Cobalt continues to allege is CW Capital took all these actions, and that increased our damages. They don't allege that CWCI took any affirmative actions. They say that the affirmative action that CWCI failed to take was to terminate CW Capital as, as special servicer back in 2011. Now, you can only be terminated once. Had they exercised that right of termination, none of these damages would have accrued. The, the application of the continuing obligation doctrine simply doesn't apply here for three reasons. One, Cobalt is pointing to the wrong obligor. The obligor that continued to act was a third party to the agreement that it has no cause of action against, CW Capital Asset Management. It's just like the case of Henry. There, the, the party alleged a breach because it was, enrol it was enrolled in a credit protection plan. And the defendant and the plaintiff in that case tried to say, no, no, no. Collateral management doctrine saves the day because those charges and damages continued to accrue each individual month, and I received a statement. It's no different than occurred here, where CW Capital continued to pay, be paid fees by the, pool, by the CMBS trusts on a monthly basis. Same exact thing. Had CWCI fired CW Capital Asset Management in 2011, none of those damages would have accrued but they were the consequence of the failure to fire CW Capital Asset Management. Second reason that, this, that the collateral management doesn't apply. The, the, um, the claims being asserted against CWCI are neither independent nor different. Cobalt's theory of the world is in each individual year, if you fail to act the next day, it's a new claim. So they would say that the failure to act in August 2011 is no different than the failure to act in 2015. If you don't fire in 2011 and you don't fire in 2015, I get a new, I get a new cause of action. That's not what the continuing obligation doc doctrine says. The continuing obligation doctrine says that the grounds for your claim Council, need to Dr. be- Council, Dr. Mazzarella, yeah. I'll ask you a question. Yeah, sure. I unmute myself first of all, thank you. <laughs> At Don't least you found the button. I frequently do not. <laughs> Don't you have a continuing contractual duty here that is not uh, ob obviated by the fact that, that they didn't claim the breach early enough, in your book, according to you? Your, your duties continue. And if you... If you don't uh, require a discount on a particular transaction, instead you take a kickback, how is uh, why is that not part of a continuing wrong? But your your honor, that's that's the point. You're referring to the wrong party. The party that's alleged to have taken the kickback is not the party to the contract that's before you. The party that's alleged to have taken the kickback was CW Capital. And I want to note that there is no allegation of breach by CW Capital in 15 years. All of those actions were perfectly appropriate. They try they merge the two together. CWCI, the collateral manager here, was mm -hmm. the collateral manager. Sorry. CWCI was the collateral manager here. And CWCI is the collateral manager and continues to be the collateral manager. But its duty was to terminate CW Capital Asset Management when, as the plaintiff said, it first became evident that fee share agreements were common. And that occurred in 2011. And they cannot then say, oh, well, you could have done the same action. This Collateral management, collateral obligation doctrine is supposed to be a narrow exception. If this court adopts the narrow exception that COBOL is advancing, there is no limitations because you can always turn an action into an inaction and claim it's within limitations. Look at the three principal cases. Henry, it was barred and the collateral obligation doctrine did not save the day. Why? Because they said damages continue to accrue. COBOL would come before you and they would argue, oh no, because they could have terminated that agreement the next day or a year later or two years later. And therefore, I'm within limitations. 
Khan was an investment advisor agreement. The allegation in that case was a failure to register, and the failure to register was outside of the limitations period. Cobalt would come forward and say, no, my claim is timely because I will allege that they could have re-registered within the window. Or Yin, the case that was cited in the brief. In that case, there were actually two actions at issue. The first action was allowing, people, allowing individuals to use corporate yes, apartments sorry, for your free. Time is up. I, your time is up, sorry. That's uh, fine, thank you, you, you have, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Packard, you have, uh, uh, I believe, two minutes in rebuttal. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first off, I just want to uh, correct, I believe I may have said 2007 in response yes, to Judge did. Gonzalez's yes, question. And I yeah. did not mean 2007, I meant 2017. Uh, it was within a year of the suit being filed. So let me let me correct the, the record on that. Thank uh, you. Secondly, uh, with regard to the reliance here, both by the court below uh, and by my colleague on Henry and Kahn, which is where they, the basket they place their eggs in. In each of those cases uh, where the claims were found to be untimely, there was a single breach outside of the limitations period, which resulted in automatic consequences in the limitations period. In Henry, it was entering the plaintiff into a credit card program that resulted in monthly fees. In Khan, it was entering the plaintiff into a contract with an unregistered investment advisor, resulting in fees under that contract. Here, in direct contrast, there was no automatic future consequences of Cobalt's investment advisors failing to stop the payment of excessive fees and kickbacks to its affiliates before the limitations period. The fact that those payments weren't stopped in 2011 did not obviate the obligation for them to be stopped in 2012 or 2013 and 2014. To Judge Mazzarelli's you know, question, there was an ongoing obligation to manage this portfolio uh, in the best interest of Cobalt. And CWCI, as alleged in the complaint, had ongoing fiduciary and contractual duties and had the counsel, ability- Counsel, this is Judge Scarpullo. So the first time you breach that obligation, that's when the statute runs. How is there, the fact is you breached it. So the first time you breach it, the statute starts running. Why is this different? Your Honor, it's different because this is like the court's decision in Bulova when you had a contract to maintain a roof for 20 years, the first time you failed to repair that roof, uh, yes, you may have breached. Uh, and, the, and that is a breach which will run after 60 years. But if you continue to fail uh, to live up to your obligations and you have continued derelictions of, of duty, the, you can bring claims within six years of any of those derelictions of duty. So, so your adversary says that your argument or, or your position means that you can you could have brought a case um, every single year, 2000 this t plus one, 2000 that plus another one, 2000 that plus another one. Is that what you're saying? The only thing we are saying is that so long as they are breaching an ongoing obligation, and these are new breaches that they are doing, for example, in connection with a sale in 2017, they approve a transaction which provides for kickbacks and excessive fees, then yes, you can bring a suit in respect of that conduct that occurred within the limitations period. It even is not a- I'm sorry, even though that same breach occurred five years earlier? It, it was not the same breach. It may be a breach of a similar type, but it's not the same breach. Why is it not the same breach? That's exactly the same breach, right? You're saying you should have, but didn't negotiate this thing. Because what happens with respect to CWCI, they have the authority to uh, approve any transactions for the sale of assets. So what happens is they are brought a transaction saying, are you going to approve this, this transaction? The transaction includes a payment of excessive fees and kickbacks. And they have an obligation. Know that, didn't you know that they weren't doing that all the way back when? No, no, we did not, Your Honor. As, as I responded to Judge Gonzalez, the Cobalt did not learn of this conduct until it was informed of it in 2017. Mr. Cross referred to certain certifications that had been signed. Those certifications were signed expressly on the basis of representations that were made by CWCI, the respondent. They are not yes, evidence I'm sorry. of knowledge. 
You're over your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Last case for argument, Barrett Depanning versus Maya Baloba and Barrett Depanning versus New York City Law. Law Court. Good evening, Your Honors. Uh, this is Ed Verdovsky for Barrett Japanning, the appellant in both cases. Uh, Judge, I, in the first case, I'd like to reserve one minute for rebuttal, and I'd like to argue the second case separately since it involves the law board, which the first one does not. Yes. Thank you. Uh, in, in the uh, Barrett Japanning versus Bialabroda case, uh, we, the case started in 2011, and um, uh, Justice Hagler reviewed in detail, both under 3211 and 3212, the allegations of the second and third causes of action four, at least four times, and we've specified in our brief when he did it, and uh, on one occasion on the record even going almost line by line with Ms. Bialabroda to explain to her why we had alleged a cause of action. We then got into discovery. There were disputes in discovery. I won't uh, take the court's time to go into the disputes, but it's all in the record. And the court ordered her uh, to appear for deposition. And then we had an issue and we had to go back to, to the judge and he, he again directed her to appear for deposition. And that ended up, we ended up in front of him. And at that stage, uh, after eight years, of, of almost eight years of litigation and all of these prior rulings, he suddenly turned around and granted summary judgment to Ms. Bialabroda uh, on the second and third causes of action and directed that the case be dismissed. And when I pointed out to him that he couldn't do that because of his prior rulings, his answer to me was, I'll vacate my prior rulings. I don't remember if he exactly said, you're right, I'll vacate my prior ruling. But the implication was, of course I was right. And I don't say that with any uh, undue pride. Uh, it, it seemed obvious that he could not do what, what he was doing. Uh, and so <clears throat> the, uh, the, the first part of our argument is clearly that uh, there was no warrant for the court doing an about face at that point, vacating the prior ruling and uh, inconsistently granting summary judgment. Discovery should have proceeded in accordance with the court's rulings. And uh, uh, we should have been permitted to take Ms. Bialabroda's deposition and get the answers that the judge had expressly directed that she give us. And then if that led to any uh, summary judgment motion practice based on the discovery that came out, perhaps uh, uh, there would have been a basis to revisit the questions. But at that point, this, there was no basis. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> the um, separately, I should say, it's, it's certainly not our second argument. Um, there were there are three substantive questions that uh, Justice Hagler addressed in granting summary judgment uh, above and beyond the procedural questions. The one is um, uh, whether um, we had a right to sue for use and occupancy uh, because uh, as is well known to this court, to based on the prior rulings and based on the record, uh, the building has no, it's an old law tenement that has no certificate of occupancy. And uh, all of a sudden, after eight years, the judge concluded that that was a, that, that barred our second claim. Uh, we believe for the reasons that we have outlined in our brief, that he is, he was incorrect in making that ruling. And especially because Ms. Bialabroda, uh, as we say in the brief, uh, converted a shield into a, into a sword. Uh, she has been subleasing unlawfully uh, in violation of the court's orders. She has been subleasing and collecting rents from her subtenants through all of this period. So regardless of what... Uh, Council, law... aren't you conflating two separate issues, though? Yes. The so... issue of... of, of um operating a uh, multiple dwelling without a certificate of occupancy is a, an issue very separate and apart from um, illegal sublets, right? And yes. you, have different, you have different remedies, don't you? Yes, and we, in the other appeal, we will be addressing uh, the, the loft board proceeding and the status of that. 
uh, which is still regarded on the record, as we've noted in our briefs, as pending. And uh, that, that's a whole other question. But our argument here is that even assuming that a landlord uh, in our position, a cooperative landlord, could not otherwise sue uh, for, for uh, rent because of the certificate of occupancy situation, that Ms. Bialabroda is a stopped from raising that as an argument because she is collecting rents from her subtenants and she cannot one of the same time say, that no, the landlord can't co collect rent because there's no, uh, there's no certificate of occupancy, but I, the sub landlord can co collect rent from my tenants. It, it is on its face, it is they're directly inconsistent arguments. And so we argue that uh, she is she is a stop. Secondly, thank you, counselor. You, you can uh, continue on rebuttal. Thank you, Judge. You're still muted. You're still you're muted, Miss Biarcoa. You're muted. Can you unmute? There you go. Oh, try it one more time. So sorry. Okay. Um, okay, don't touch anything. Go ahead. Uh, may it please the court um, and forgive me in advance for my uneducated and inartful pleadings. Um, the fundamental issue here in this action is that the plaintiff is asking, had asked the court below and is asking the appellate division to grant it damages for liabilities which this plaintiff has not proven. There is no evidence of a court order terminating my proprietary leases to be able to claim use and occupancy. There is no court order terminating my proprietary leases to enable this plaintiff to claim unjust enrichment. Well, Furthermore, do, you, do you pay rent or use an occupancy? No, I don't because they're barred from collecting rent. Do they, you collect rent from a subtenant? Oh, I do, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the penalty. They are barred because if they there's no have, certificate of occupancy for the apartment, and that means they can't collect rent from you, how can you collect rent from someone else? Because, because they're in non-compliance with court orders to register the building with the law okay. board. Put that aside. The building is not registered, right? Right. There's no certificate of occupancy for the apartment, correct? Right. And it's your position that therefore they cannot collect rent or use an occupancy from you. Right. And that was okay. the position. So how also. can you how can you collect sub rent from a subtenant on an apartment that has no certificate of occupancy? Because the loft law in um in uh, title um twenty nine paragraph 2-09, I think then it's C, and then there's some other numbers, uh, says that I can sublet. We're talking about the multiple dwelling law. You can sublet an apartment that has no certificate of occupancy? The well, law says that? Yes, I can sublet really? without a certificate of occupancy. I'm not the one that is in control of getting a certificate, certificate of occupancy. The landlord is. It is the landlord's penalty for not complying for 18 years. They've defied six 
No, eight different court so, orders. So I want to be clear. So the, 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 the issue is because there's no certificate of occupancy, that means that perhaps the uh, premises, the unit is, is inhabitable, should not be inhabited, right? Should, no one should reside there. You should not reside there because there's an issue in terms of its occupancy. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Um, pursuant to the multiple dwelling law, uh, 286 subsection 1, paragraph 286, uh, continued residence, residency by residential occupants in a dwelling that is an, an interim multiple dwelling, and the Loft Board has decided that it was, um, is protected. Then why is it okay for you to sublet or have other individuals reside in that unit? Because all the other shareholder tenants sublet also. The plaintiff has targeted me with all these litigations for 20 years. The law is very clear. The penalty is on the landlord for non-compliance. I'm just a shareholder tenant. I have fought. I had applied to the loft board. Well, are you a shareholder in the landlord? Yes, I am. And I have applied. I went, I've gone to great lengths to have this plaintiff legalize the building. So I'm clear. Wait, so you're a shareholder. So the monies that you are collecting for the as a condo unit, where is that money going to? Is there any uh, fund or anything for the upkeep of the building or the the repair of the boiler or the roof or anything of that nature for the monies that you and the other cooperators, uh, cooperators are collecting? Con There's no repairs. There's been uh, a, a dismantling of essential services like an elevator and I live and work on the top floor. I pay for the repairs. I have replaced windows at great expense, uh, which is the landlord's obligation. I have paid out of my pocket for the repair of the roof because I'm on the top floor and it leaks incessantly. They have done no repairs. Uh, they have, in fact, not only that, but they had for years I paid rent, even when they increased the rent 100%. I mean, shareholder tenants squawk in New York City if they increase the rent 5%. They increased it 100%. And I still paid it, and I paid it for nine years until the amount of abuse, all these litigations... 11 litigations against me, non-stop. All these litigations were so, such an so abuse. I don't, I don't understand this, ma'am. So if the, if, the apart, if, if the apartment is in such deplorable condition, as you say, and the building is in such deplorable condition, as you say, how is that any different for your tenants? Um, Respectfully, I disagree. I have made it. I have made my premises very nice at my cost. I paid for the plumbing. I pay for the heating. I, you know, I pay for everything. So you see, my income from the subtenants go into the building. The loft board protects. I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you very much, Steph. You have, Mr. Radasa, you have uh, two minutes on rebuttal. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, a few items. Number one, um, the, the, uh, there's been no other uh, residential subleasing by anyone in the building. That's the essence of the dispute as reflected in the many uh, actions, including actions in this court, uh, appeals to this court. Uh, the, the others, uh, um, cooperatives, have only subleased for commercial purposes. Uh, the loft board proceeding is not final, and we will discuss that in the other case, I believe. Uh, Anything in reply uh, to Ms. Barrett, what she just stated? Anything in reply to her? Yes, yes. I mean, these are the points she made. Uh, the, the building is not in deplorable condition. There are no violations against it. Uh, we, we, she was, uh, 
the civil court uh, upheld the termination of her lease, I believe it's 2010, uh, as reasonable by the board in light of her residential subleasing. Uh, there's a whole history to this, which time does not permit us to go into. But, but as you have... stated, there's no certificate of occupancy. Oh, no, there is no, no, clearly, there is no certificate of occupancy, that, and, and that's still an open question. Uh, at least that's our argument. And if you look at the, even the law board website says the application is pending. Uh, the, uh, we, we are seeking in the other appeal, the opportunity to, uh, to go back to the law board and, uh, and, and continue to argue our point. We don't accept. Okay, let's move on. Board. Let's move on to the second appeal then. Thank you, judge. Uh, so on that one also, I'd like to reserve two minutes if I may. Uh, yeah. the, second, the, the second appeal comes down to this. We've outlined the dates. Uh, we were prompt and timely and in, in seeking reconsideration, which is the authorized method, even though it says reconsideration, uh, you don't get a first consideration when there's a, a um, uh, after a, a hearing, a fa evidentiary hearing in oath, uh, the law board uh, takes the report and recommendation of the the ALJ and issues the decision. And if you disagree with it, that is your opportunity, your only opportunity, your first opportunity to submit to the law board. We followed in this instance this very, and it's undisputed, the very same procedure we had followed previously with respect to a ruling a recommendation by the administrative law judge where the law board so, had up. So, counsel, we're yes. we're aware of of the record and the fact that the law board um, decided that the filing was untimely, incomplete, Correct. and it was a fact submission instead of a, we know all about those issues. Um, my question you to use a little different. Um, are you able to file a brand new application to the law board? Not that I'm aware of, Judge. I have to, Do you have, have that one shot? Yes, this is our shot. If if the, the law board has issued a ruling requiring us to uh, to get a certificate of occupancy, but we never had a chance, as you tried, I was explaining and you've indicated you're aware of, we never had a chance to uh, to contest that ruling. Mr. Uh, Mr. Rudofsky, excuse me, this is Judge Shulman. Uh, maybe I'm confused, so clear this up for me. It is my understanding on, uh, under the applicable regulation, law board regulation, that uh, a, a reconsideration is not the equivalent of a petition for administrative review before the Division of uh, Homes and Renewals. And what, what I say is you don't have to file reconsideration to exhaust your administrative remedy to commence an Article 78 on the merits of the oath judge's ruling because the law says you can do that. So as I understand it on this record, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the rules for reconsideration require that you file a certain number of copies with an original signature and you pay the appropriate fee and et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's procedural centric and they have the right to insist on that, just like this court has the right to insist on how many briefs you file and when you file it and how you file it and the, and the font type. As, as to make a, that kind of analogy. So that being said, isn't your whole appeal here solely focused on the so-called arbitrariness uh, of, of, of the law board rejecting the re reconsideration based on, on your, your failure to comply with its rules? And you did not address, bear with me, you did not address the merits, the substantive merits of the underlying uh, ruling of the law board. Am I wrong on that? We didn't address it in our brief. It's addressed in the record. It's the letter of May 27th, 2016, uh, which address, which which is the request for reconsideration, if I'm understanding your question correctly. And uh, my under, they send you instructions when they give you these decisions uh, that you should, if you disagree, you should move for reconsideration. And that is exactly what we did in the prior round uh, of uh, litigation uh, and uh, our we faxed in our request for reconsideration, et cetera. It was accepted. It was upheld. Here, they objected. They said our, our submission was incomplete. 
We didn't pay the fee. We didn't send in the requisite number of copies. We did all of that. They kept the fee. I mean, it's been overlooked in all of this. They said you didn't pay the fee. We sent in the fee. They retained the fee. Months went by. Four months later, I believe, they, they said, oh, well, we're not going to pass on the merits. Uh, we believe it is fundamentally unfair. Yes, they have a right to their procedural rules. There's no doubt. I don't think they get, uh, but, but I think they have to be reasonable and fair and not arbitrary in how they- Thank you. You uh, have uh, two minutes of rebuttal. Um, Thank you. Ms. Fletcher? Good afternoon. May it please the court. Kate Fletcher for the New York City Loft Board. I would initially say that it was not necessary for Barrett Japaning to pursue reconsideration in, all, in order to challenge the underlying loft law coverage determination. It is clear that Barrett Japaning had the opportunity to go straight to an Article 78 petition. It chose not to. It is not in any way the loft board's responsibility if Barrett Japaning then failed to timely file an application in accordance with the very clear, very explicit rules that are available, despite the fact that it was represented by counsel. Although it did fax a letter for reconsideration on May 27th, that letter was both fatally incomplete and submitted in an inappropriate manner. The law board rules do not authorize an application for reconsideration to be filed by fax. They state that it may be, be submitted by hand delivery or regular mail. This makes sense because the law board rules require an application fee to be submitted at the time of filing in order for the application to be considered filed. Therefore, a faxed application would not make sense. It is not relevant that answers, which can be submitted by fax, there is no fee at issue in an answer. In addition, it is not a minor manner in which Barrett Japaning failed to comply with the law board's rules. It was required to submit five copies and an original of the application form, submitted none. It was required to submit the, the determination to be reconsidered. It did not. It was required to submit a specified proof of service of service on Ms. Bialabroda. Again, it did not do so. It was also required to submit the fee and failed to do so and it is therefore materially and fatally incomplete. So counsel, it is also, I'm yes. going to ask you the same question that I asked opposing counsel. So let's assume that we agree that you have, as the board, have the right to create your own procedures and requirements as far as submissions go, all right? Um, the, the decision says that until such time as there is approval of the law board, no rent may be uh, recovered. Okay, does, does, the, does Barrett Japaning have the ability to come before the law board separately and again? Is this a one-shot deal as he says, this is, the, this is its, the uh, plaintiff's only chance? The plaintiff has actually had numerous times to come before the loft board. The there were multiple hearings on the actual determination. And then the, the plaintiff had the opportunity to seek an Article 78 review and chose not to. Instead, it chose to seek consideration. It then failed to timely file and is now saying that it missed its only opportunity to speak before the loft board. This is, in fact, not the case. It's had multiple opportunities to represent its interest. And the fact that the law board then made it a determination in disagreement does not mean that it was deprived of an opportunity to set forth its position. That's not exactly my question. I'm sorry. I perhaps I've misunderstood. It's OK. My question is, are there any other remedies available to the plaintiff? Obviously, they have to get a C of O. Mm -hmm. If they don't, if they get a C of O, they can, I assume they can return to the law board. I apologize, Your Honor. I have not briefed that particular issue uh, and I'm not able to answer you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Biavarola, did you have anything else you wanted to add in terms yes. of the yes. law board's consideration? 
Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, this is not uh, an only incident whereby the plaintiff, the petitioner in this case, was late. The petitioner has cultivated a policy of avoiding the legalization of the building. They have been under court order since 2002 to obtain a certificate of occupancy. They have done everything not to do it. It's very easy. All it takes is for the petitioner to register the building with the loft board in order to proceed with its regular life, collecting rent from me, et cetera, et cetera. It has refused, and it's inexpensive to register the building with the loft board. It has refused to do it. It has refused to do it because it is intent on not legalizing the building. Otherwise, it makes no sense. It makes no sense in O'Flaherty versus Schwimmer. It is to the benefit of the plaintiff to increase the value of its major asset, the building, and obtain a certificate of occupancy. It is in its interest to do so, but it won't do so. Thank and you. This is Thank you very much. Mr. Rudowski, you have two minutes. Yes, yes you have two minutes. Two very, two very quick points. Number one, it is absolutely untrue that there was an order in 2002 or any time prior to this loft board order directing that the building be legalized. It's just a false statement. Number two, uh, if you look at uh, page 42 in the record, you'll see the notice that they sent along with the decision, which directs us that a party aggrieved by the termination of the law board may file an application for reconsideration of the termination, et cetera, and to be, goes down and to be considered timely, a reconsideration application must be received within 30 days. Now it says other things. I don't want. I never misrepresent to the court, and I don't want to misrepresent. Clearly, it says uh, that the there should be an application, and the, refers to the statute. Uh, and I I have never claimed, and I wouldn't claim that we complied with this uh, set of rules only because we followed the exact same procedure we had followed previously when when we obtained a favorable ruling by the law board when the uh, when the ALJ issued a summary judgment against us, and we we got that reversed, so we did the exact same thing we did previously. And my answer to the law board's argument is they are exalting form over substance to to an incredible degree. This is fundamentally unfair. Uh, we we corrected whatever errors they pointed out within days. They didn't say we didn't file an application. They said we filed an incomplete application. And there's a difference. The, the, the CPLR, certainly, and the CPLR doesn't apply to the law board, but it says the fundamental rule about errors and irregularities. If a, if a, if a, fundament, if a substantive right is not prejudiced, it should be ignored. So if that's the rule in court, how is it that the law board gets to pick and choose when they will waive these rules and accept papers, and when they won't, it is it's the essence of being arbitrary. And thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank that concludes you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. the proceedings of the Appellate Division First Department for today. Court is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Your Honor.